It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour. It is Monday, November 12th, 2018, and Caesar is home. Welcome, everyone. My name is Luke Thomas. And this is the MMA Hour right here on MMAfighting.com. Thank you so much for joining me. I greatly appreciate it. I mean, you want to talk about a jam-packed, enormous show. We've got it. So with the Monday Morning Analyst, we're going to look at Cowboy's Armbar. We're going to look at Yair's Elbow. We'll do the weigh-in where we talk about Chaz Skelly being robbed because, by the way, he was robbed. We'll do a round of tweets. You'll be my guest for the sound off. And we've got five guests. Misha Tate. The new VP of one is going to be here. Oscar De La Hoya is going to be here to talk about his feud with Floyd, as well as his big MMA show coming up. Let's see. The coach of Yair Rodriguez, Israel Martinez, is going to be here. Chaz Skelly himself is going to be here. And legendary broadcaster Mauro Ronaldo is going to be here. I mean, what more could you possibly ask for? The answer is nothing. Uh, all right. Thank you guys so much for joining me. As always, we'll be taking your tweets and your calls. Those tweets, use the hashtag the MMA Hour, and keep those calls coming at 844-866-2468. And, of course, you can always email the show as well with a question, but more particularly a voice recording for our international listeners, the MMA Hour at voxmedia.com. All right. Not a moment to waste. Hope everyone had a great weekend. I did. Uh, I took a three-day weekend because I almost collapsed from fatigue. But you don't care about that. In any event, it was a fun weekend, but I'm ready to get the uh, show. And the week started because we go from one MMA event to another one, this time in Buenos Aires. All right, uh, let's talk to my man in the back. He is the uh, Arequipe to my pan, the arroz to my frijoles. He is the, um, what do you want to call it? He is the... Septima to my Bogota. How about that, huh? My, my arroz to my leche. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's up, man? Yo, how's it going? It goes Good. well. Yeah, yeah. I am tired beyond description. Same, but look at you, caffeine. Coffee, Dude, this yeah. Co I should have gone to that place because I won't say this name of this place. Coffee is straight up basura. Um, did you enjoy the fights on Saturday? Of course. I gotta say, fantastic. first of all, card. shouts to the UFC for the graphics and the oh, sound yeah. packages. They should just keep them. Man. I know. I know. <laughs> I was, the shit. I was That's like, super cool. I was like, you didn't improve them since then, uh, but. Uh, Outside of your main and co-main, anything stand out to you about that card? Anybody, anybody stand out to you about it? Jermaine, mm, Jermaine picked up a win. She was very. It was a very important win for her. Yeah. Um, who else was out there? How about Macy Barber? Macy Barber, yeah, calling her shots as well. Pretty impressive. Slashing um, people up on that. Yeah, those elbows were nasty. She's a fun addition to to that division, the strawweight division, which just keeps getting better and better. And do that main event. I swear to God, MMA. Yeah, is just it's just the most ridiculously impossible sport. How how does anybody ever get good at MMA? There are so many ways, and frankly, it's like there's so many ways to win, so many ways to lose. This is one of those bouts. First of all, anytime you see both guys in hospital gurneys and in um, yep. gowns, uh, you know that that fight took some years off their life. I mean, I, 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 we love those fights. But, yo, they left a piece yeah, of yeah, themselves yeah. in Denver that night, yeah. for sure. But the other part is, like, how does anybody ever get good when you can – I thought I had Korean Zombie winning, although I, I granted it was a little bit tight. Yeah. How do you ever get good when there's no – not mo, no margin for error, but, I mean, in the most unexpected ways. Yeah. You can't ever really, you know, catch your chickens more I than mean, that. MMA, MMA, you got to be both good and in some ways lucky, man. If, yeah. if you're unlucky, you're you're not gonna get you know too far, you know. Uh, and the fight game, the fight game luck is a very important factor. Uh, Mike Brown told me this years ago, and he's like, I think when he got knocked out by um, Steven Seiler, he's just like, hey man, you fight so many times, you roll a die so many times, like think you know you fight forty times, there's there's something gonna happen, you know, some weird abnormality. Or, or some sort of weird outcome. So it's, this it's, is just the way MMA works. And, man. and speaking of fighting for a long time, Cowboy Cerrone, most UFC wins, yep. most UFC wins by stoppage. I'm almost, I'm almost glad a non-champion holds that. By the way, yeah. that distinction because it's a nice record. Yeah, it's a nice record, and it's the kind of thing where if you're very careful and manicuring who comes next and what that means and the risk and the reward, you shouldn't have the honor of having the most wins in the UFC, unless you're just right. dumb talented, right? Right, right, right? But I kind of want the guy who's like, yeah, I'll knuckle up with this guy and that one and that one and that one. I, I kind of like that that guy has the record. Yeah, 
Yeah, certainly nice. Uh, Big win for him as well. Calls good today? Tweets, how are they? I've, I've not even, actually, I've not even talked to you about we it. Got, we got tons of calls. We might not really? even feature all of them. Oh, so many. Um, hopefully, for next show, we'll, we'll get to roll over some of them. But we got a lot of good calls. Do you ever know like what the rhyme or reason is? Like, okay, if Connor fights, we get a lot of stuff. But that's true right. for everybody. Why is it that sometimes we just get like a, an ass load of tweets? And then the next week we'll be like, eh, I got a few tweets and we just have avalanche of calls. Right. I, I think obviously the news cycle is very important, but I think also the kind of MMA that we're watching, like a lot of the, the fight, we, we got some calls of like people calling right after the event, like, and you can tell they're all psyched out, like, oh my God, yeah, you're, you know, KZ. So Interesting. Um, I think that plays a big factor. All right. So we'll get back to you a little bit later in the show. We are going to do the sound off. We just got a ton of stuff to get to today. Yeah. All right. Gotta, I'm gonna stay on track. Not a moment to lose. I'll come back to you in a little bit later, sir. All right. Thank you. There he goes, Dan Segura. All right. Let's kick this show off the right way, shall we? It is time, ladies and gentlemen, for the weigh-in. Time now for the weigh-in right here on the MMA Hour. There's nothing else to start this show with than the discussion about what happened with Chaz Skelly. Uh, in his bout on Saturday night uh, with Mr. Uh, Moffat, I believe, caught in a uh, uh, Darce choke, essentially, and they were doing the Three Stooges bit where one was trying to chase into the other one and the one was chasing himself out of it. Uh, and Tim Mills, the referee, kind of tests the arm, pulls it apart. Uh, Skelly can't believe it. They go and review the tape, and then the referee... <laughs> Sticks with his really bad decision. There was like, that was the most MMA moment I'd seen in quite some time. It's like the levels of fail that you have to peel away to get to the core issue is pretty amazing. So let's peel back some of them because I, I think this exercise is worth doing. Um, so definitively, let's answer the question. Was Chaz Skelly wronged? The answer is incontestably i do not care what referee tim mills tells you i do not care what any other member of that colorado athletic commission tries to say there is no good argument for having looked at the instant replay and decided that the initial call was good it's not possible unless you're just willfully committed to really bad standards or you have vision problems it's either one of the two it cannot be anything other than that. Here is basically what's so wrong about it. A couple of things. Number one, think about just how crude that test is. Is a guy's arm floppy? How floppy is it? By the way, I would encourage you to go back and watch. It's actually not that floppy. I had this, sur this shoulder surgically repaired in 2009. I am currently in physical therapy three days a week for this one so that I can avoid surgery. As you can see, I've got the shoulders of a grandmother, but the point being is this, I know what shoulder mobility looks like. I know what shoulder mobility looks like when someone's injured, when someone is sort of uh, not consciously thinking about it, and when someone is totally out. It does not flop. It's loose, it doesn't really flop. So it doesn't even pass the eye test in that regard. Moreover, as I mentioned, it's like a measurement of like someone's uh, cognition or frankly, uh, um, not, I wouldn't say sentience exactly, but certainly someone's a measurement of someone being awake, um, consciousness, it's a crude measurement. It's not worthless. It can at times be helpful. It's just very limited. Now, here's the first problem. The initial call is just bad. I don't think that's necessarily all that big a problem. Look at all of these other sports. And in America, I'll just go through them. American football. American even baseball now, American basketball. You've got VAR uh, overseas. Um, well, to limited degrees anyway, in soccer. Here's the point I'm trying to make. In all of those sports, it is built in with the implicit understanding that a referee getting the call right the first time is not something you can rely upon. The reality is they're going to get it wrong. So you build in these other mechanisms so that they can self-correct. People were saying things like, oh, well, the referee um, who made the call is now viewing his own tape. I don't really mind that so much. An extra set of eyeballs couldn't have hurt, but that's not really the issue. The issue is the lack of humility involved by referee Tim Mills in not overturning it, in looking at what is incontestably 
uh, a gentleman who was not done in whatsoever and then deciding, yeah, F it. Let's just roll through with it. You have to basically believe to go through the process that they went through that the referees at MMA either don't make mistakes or don't make mistakes big enough to correct. So you've got this crude arm test, which is valuable but limited. You've got now this use of replay. By the way, replay is used in MMA, but once they use it, they can't go back to anything. Best case scenario, it would have just been, I guess, a no contest because you can't start the fight over, which is another whole host of problems in and of itself. Uh, And folks have said, well, it puts the referee in a bit of a tough position. Yeah, that's the position they signed up for. They signed up to be in the tough positions. That is what they asked. Now, I would be happy to have Tim Mills on the show. I'd be happy to have anyone from the Colorado Athletic Commission. And I'll be cl- come clean here. I asked neither of them because after 12 or so years in this business, I have learned that the Athletic Commissions of the United States do not believe that they are accountable to anybody. They don't have to answer my email requests. They don't have to pick up my phone calls. They don't have to come and talk about it. Maybe even Tim Mills wants to. Sometimes referees want to. And the Athletic Commission will prevent them from doing that. That's another problem that you run into all the time. Um, So I don't know what the truth is there. Here's what I know. I guarantee you they won't. I guarantee you they won't. Standing invitation, they won't talk about it because they do not believe, ultimately, that they are accountable to the public in any kind of recognizable way. So you've got people who basically believe that MMA referees don't make errors or don't make errors worth editing. You've got already a bad call to begin with. You now have a commission. All the commissions are like this, by the way, with a slight exception in California. I do think Andy Foster tries to at least have some discussion about this. And in this particular case, you have a commission that just does not believe that they owe anybody an explanation, not merely now, but ever. Uh, You have a referee who, by the way, in Tim Mills, who just last May on an LFA show had a royally poor performance. Here he is back out again. We have no real understanding of what he's talking about. He apparently tells Chaz Skelly it's an eye-fluttering issue, but there's really no mention of that. Then the commission goofs and calls it a TKO when it's not a TKO, which is yet another problem. So you've got all of these sort of different ways in which they have totally failed here. Like, an arm can be limp-ish for a lot of different reasons in those scenarios. The choke was tight, but it wasn't complete. And a guy like Chaz Skelly, who's never been submitted, you have to give a bit of a... Uh, a benefit of the doubt of. The arm test, by the way, Chaz Skelly doesn't even really fail, fail the arm test. As bad as that test is, he doesn't even fail it. He still calls him apart, then doubles down on the air with use of technology. Commission won't ever say anything about it because they don't have to. There's no law requiring them to. And all, all together, it ends up with one guy being screwed for no particular reason, pay cut in half, and and here we go. And ultimately, did the commission lose? No. Did the referee lose? I guarantee you he keeps getting assignments. And maybe he should, but we don't really have the ability to have that conversation because they won't have it with you. Here is the biggest core problem. It's less about a referee made an error because instant replay can, in theory, fix that. It's less about the limits of of instant replay, although there are some of those as well. It's less about the arm test. It's less about the mechanics of the choke. It's something at the core that I see in MMA all the time, all the freaking time, which is everybody in a position of authority uses that authority as their sole argument to assert themselves, right? No one in MMA ever wants to have a debate because very few people can actually defend their ideas here. It's just the reality of it. If someone really asked you, which ideas could you really defend that you believe? How many could you really argue for if someone was being a very uh, difficult interlocutor with you? It'd be kind of hard. No one in MMA wants to do that. What they all want to do is they want to say, aha, I'm the referee. I have final say. I'm the promoter. I can do what I want. I'm the manager. I can say yes or no. Right? They just assert their status over something rather than grappling with the details of it, rather than making an argument. Nobody in MMA ever wants to make an argument because I think most of them can't. Nobody ever wants to do anything other than rest on the argument from authority. I have power. 
Therefore, end of story. And we are left with collateral damage every which way. By the way, the media is guilty of this too. I'm the media. I know better. People do it all the time. No one ever wants to make an argument about it. Here's the argument. The argument is pretty clearly that the arm test involved is a limited test. Even with that limited test, Chaz Scaly did not fail it. There are now competing narratives from that referee about why he stopped it altogether. The evidence is quite conclusive that that was a premature stoppage. Uh, the referee refused to recognize this quite obvious fact. I don't know about his full record because the commission won't make it really available. They won't tell us if they grade internally. And if they did, what kind of grades it would get. And they won't really answer to any of these problems because no commission ever wants to because they don't have to. Basically. Basically. With a couple exceptions here or there. I have mentioned California before. I'll give New Jersey a pass as well because they've actually tried to work out some things with me in the past. That's about it. That's about it. Because this is a sport where people claim titles and they claim positions, and then claim, I'm done. I don't ever have to make a case for something because my case is my title. And so we end up in positions like this. That was an absolutely egregious failure. That commission and that referee totally effed up. They absolutely, unequivocally took that from Chas Skelly, and maybe Moffitt was on his way to winning, but he hadn't won yet. He looked very, very good as a fighter. I take nothing from him other than he may have got right up to that finish line, but he didn't cross it, right? Everything about that was a fail. Everything about that was a fail. And when given the option, they still decided to back it. They still decided to double down and say, yeah, you know what? Who really is Chaz Skelly? F him. We don't really owe anybody anything, do we? It's the argument from authority everywhere you go in this sport. I don't ever want to have to argue for my ideas because at the end of the day, I just believe what I want to because it's good for me. And I don't ever want to have to make a case publicly because under scrutiny, it probably will fail. So let me just retreat onto my power enclave and just say, this is enough. I'm good here. Well, this is the problem with the sport. Learn to make arguments. Learn to actually stand on the value of your ideas. If your guy made a call and it's good, justify it. Open invitation to any athletic commission who wants to come on here and debate these ideas. Now and forever. So long as I sit in this chair, commission members are going to be welcome to come here. Watch how many come through. Ready for this? It'll be zero. Because not one of them has the guts to do it. Ever. At any point. For any reason. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the way in. All right. Let's do this now. We're a little bit behind schedule already, but uh, we'll make it work. Let's do this. How about a round of tweets? All right. As soon as the clock starts working, then we will go. Here we go. All right. How much money will it take to see Luke watch Floyd Mayweather walking out to face the pain? To fight Tension Nasakawa in an MMA fight. Well, I got to tell you, if he fought Tension in an MMA fight, you could play Face the Pain as the soundtrack to the fight. I would still watch it. Next. Uh, would you rank Yair's KO of the zombie in the UFC's top five of all time KOs? Now, I have to think about that for a second. Uh, I, I don't know exactly. I've never put together an informal list of the list of KOs. Um... So I don't know, but I got to tell you, that's one of the most interesting KOs ever. And it's, if it's not in the top five, it has to be in the top ten. Next. Would the whole hugging and high-fiving thing in the main event be a topic today had Yair not finished the fight? I doubt that Dana and the UFC would have given five the night without that finish. Great fight, though. I listen from Brazil every week. Well, what's up, Brazil? Um, the high-fiving did get annoying, but it was still a pretty great fight independent of that. Someone actually introduced a theory to me. They were saying that at the end, Yair raises his hands, like the, the very last 10 seconds, and it may have thrown off the Korean zombie, which is why he charged like that. I ultimately don't buy that argument because I'm going to show you that that's not, that's probably not true, but it's an interesting theory nonetheless. But in any case, it might have had the fight been boring. Well, certainly they wouldn't be in contention for fight of the night at that point, but it, it, Dana would have come down on him if the fight was boring. But even with it, the fight was pretty great. Next. Will El Pantera get a title shot? Ooh. 
Um, Frankie's still kind of out there. Maybe they do a rematch. The, the Zabit fight still is holding people's attention with good reason. So probably not. Probably not. But um, he's close. He's got, what, a, what a comeback. Uh, incredible. Next. So who does Jermaine Duran to me fight next? Good question. Um, well, I'm not sure where she goes from here. Where do they have with the rankings? Because at Bantamweight, it's just sort of this weird moment, right? Like, what do you do with all these people? Um, I would say, i pull up women's Bantamweight here. She's currently sitting at five. She just beat four. You've got Pena, Ketlin Vieira, and then Holly. So I guess Ketlin, probably, if they, if, unless Juliana comes back. I don't know who else it could be because they're not going to give her Cyborg, right? And she's not going to take Cyborg. So I don't know. I don't know. Probably those, maybe Katzengano, something like that. We'll have to see. Next. Did you watch Usyk versus Bellew? Uh, What are Usyk's chances against top heavyweights as Joshua Wilder and Fury? Well, he has a bit of a size discrepancy, obviously, Usyk. Yeah, I did watch on DAZN. Um, it was incredible, right? Usyk um, just ran through. Well, actually, he had some trouble early, but then when he took over, he just ran away with it. Uh, guy cleaned out that division in two years. Two years it took him to clean out um, cruiserweight. So how would he do against the top heavyweights like Joshua Wilder and Fury? I don't really know. First of all, we need to see exactly. Joshua, I don't know, man. He's, he's Part of me thinks the size discrepancy is too big. Part of me also thinks that Usyk is a better boxer than all of them. But the Wilder and Fury one, I actually, since they got a fight coming up in December, I actually want to see where they're at against one another before I can make a clean call. Wilder's power is astronomical, but he's not nearly the boxer that Usyk is. And Fury, how is Fury after all he's been through? It'll be interesting to see. Next. Uh, with a UFC show on literally every week for nine straight weeks from the Smith Uzdemir to the Lee Iaquinta fight, do you think that the company is burning its fans out? Bro, they've been doing this for years. This year has seen a huge drop in viewership and buy rates, and I feel too many shows might be mainly to blame. The thing is, they've always promoted it as like, well, if you didn't want to watch this fight, just skip it and watch the next one. But the problem with that is two things. Number one, there's actually continuity between events. Like if you just pick up on the big ones, you miss a lot of stuff in between it. That ultimately can uh, create hurdles to becoming re-engaged with the sport. And secondly, I don't think it's meant to be consumed like that. But it, it, the sport is much more about just peaking all the time, much like the athletes themselves rather than just banquet food that you're shipping out constantly. Um, it's, not main, it's not meant to be treated like a baseball regular season. Each one is supposed to have independent and extraordinary value. And when it doesn't follow that model, the results speak for themselves. Next, last one. It has to be Justin Gaethje that Cerrone was talking about as an exciting opportunity in his move back to 155. I'm 100% on that. Your thoughts. Man, if it ain't, there's a crime happening. Because that is absolutely the fight to make at this point. All right, not a moment to waste. Appreciate all the tweets and everything else. It is time now, ladies and gentlemen, for the Monday Morning Analyst. All right, look at that. Can you see me? All these tweets up here. All right, time now for the Monday Morning Analyst right here on the MMA Hour. Um, I always ask folks on my Facebook page, cheap plug, facebook.com slash Luke Thomas News. I always ask you guys, what is it you want to see on the MMA analyst? Because it was up to me, I might pick certain things that you don't like. And everyone said overwhelmingly they wanted to see Cerrone's armbar, and they wanted to see how the elbow, essentially, from Yair was set up. So that's what we will do today. Um, let me show you the Cerrone armbar real quickly, and then we'll get to... The Yair stuff, I have a few more things I want to say about Yair that even the audio podcast listeners, I think, can appreciate, um, independent of what the graphics or everything else might show. So let's go ahead and go to the screen now if we can. Uh, two weeks in a row, hey, we might have some uh, We might have some success. We actually have no plug-in today. I've got a new iPad. Look at this, right? Hey, no plug-in. Woo! Nobody cares. All right, just me. All right, um, I, I, I don't have a ton of footage to show because I don't want to. Um, besides, getting to two finishes can get a little dicey with the UFC. They get real protective over stuff like that. So, uh, But it aired on TV and everyone saw this stuff. Anyway, 
So here is Cowboy Cerrone underneath. Here is Mike Perry on top. How did this come from this position to an arm bar the other way? A couple things happened. See the red tape right there? Why am I pointing when I have this? Oops. Let me clear that off. Wrong one. Here we go. All right. See that red glove right there? That is Cerrone. Cerrone has the red glove, okay? So that means the blue gloves are going to be Mike Perry. Just follow along here. So you're going to see him do this. See the hand over here? The hand is behind the neck. He's going to move it in front to frame. When he moves it in front to frame, Mike Perry decides, aha, Americana time. Or they call them key locks or paint brushes. Essentially, hand in line with the ear. The hand goes back. The elbow comes forward to the point where then they drive it. Well, they kind of drive it on the same line as the ear, but they kind of drive it in and down. I can't even, I literally, uh, because of my shoulder therapy, I literally can't even put my back against the wall and have my elbows touch. So imagine if someone is manipulating it past even a natural point of discomfort, right? So that's what happens. He now tries to sit up. You see him reaching here. Look right, right there. See that? That's the, that's the position for the key lock right there that he's trying to set up. And uh, the problem is, as soon as he sets it up, Cerrone decides, I'm going to bring, if someone has a key lock out here and you bring it to your body and then put your weight to the side on the same side. So now my, rather than having my back on the mat, my shoulders on the mat, it kills it, right? Because now you're mechanically in a place where they don't have a lot of leverage over you. So that's what he does. He kind of goes to his side, except this time he keeps going to his base. Already, already Mike Perry's in trouble. Joe, why is Mike Perry in trouble? Do you know? You don't know, right? His hips are in the air. You see that? Look at that. All the way in the air to the point his feet are off the ground. That's a major problem for him. When If two places you don't want to be are someone completely on top of you or someone lifting your weight off the ground, either with a body lock or some kind of guard they're using, his weight is all up in the air. And here's the thing that, that, that Mike Perry is doing. He's still holding on to, if I go back here, look, He's still holding on to the Kimura, or excuse me, the, the paintbrush. He doesn't let it go. That's a major problem for one reason. Number one, his weight gets picked up. Look at this. His weight is completely up off the ground. That means he can get turned and pulled and maneuvered because you don't have any control over your body anymore. The other problem is when you're back here, if someone tries a Kimura on you, you can actually go around their arm. Not a Kimura, I'm sorry, a paintbrush. Someone tries a paintbrush or Americana or a key lock on you, you can actually go around, key lock them, and then actually turn that into a reversal. Cerrone doesn't do that. But what he does do is he goes to his base. By the way, if he did that, Kimura, oh, sorry, if he did that key lock on uh, Perry, it would look similar to this. It actually would go almost identically. He doesn't do that. What he does do is, he gets to his base. Perry holds on to the key lock way too long. So watch what happens. He realizes, look at him. He realizes he's in trouble here. Floating, and he's going to lose control. Now look at also something. Look at that arm. It's deep on the inside of the body of Cerrone. What does that mean? That means you can attach it to yourself and you can bring it across, which will open them up or attach it to your body. Now you can control them, right? So you've got the weight off the ground and now the arm is being tucked in way underneath. Two recipes for disaster on a thing like this. I actually think that this is a, um, Cerrone is doing that same key lock reversal from side control, just in a different way. He goes from side control to his hips and if they hold on to the key lock for too long, then he does what he's about to do. Kind of similar to a Von Fluchok. What's a Von Fluchok? It's when someone holds on to that position, like a guillotine, in the wrong position too long. If you hold on to something in the wrong position too long, there's all kinds of counters to it, which is exactly what you're going to see here. So now you see Cerrone is even deeper. Look at how high the hips are off the ground of Perry. He's got no attachment to the ground whatsoever posting on that right hand, he's just going to pick him up. Look at the arm. Look at the arm of Perry. It's all the way across like a seatbelt, like, like you're uh, doing the discount double check in your Aaron Rodgers. It's all the way across there. And now all he's going to do is sit up, and he's going to swim back around with his own 
uh, left arm like there. Why is he doing that? Because when he puts this underhook on the far side, now he has a method of control across his body when he comes up on top. That underhook, without it, he could just sit up again. He is claiming the inside space here on top. It's a very, very necessary condition. It's also good for passing. It's a lot of different things, right? So he gets on top. Blah, blah, blah. He tries to go knee on belly. Blah, blah, blah. Now Cerrone eventually, excuse me, uh, Perry eventually gets to his feet. And um, you can see uh, Cerrone tries to take the back. Whoops, not a lot to say about that. Well, I'm still learning how to use this new iPad. This is a terrible position. I don't want to go into because we're short on time. But um, you can just, I mean, look, he's got sort of like an over under here. A lot of times, by the way, guys in grappling, I don't know. I don't know if this is what Mike Perry thought. I don't know. A lot of times guys will think if they can sneak one arm behind the leg of their opponent that they can then come out the back door. Uh, you can't. I'm not saying that's what he was thinking. I don't know. But I see this a lot sometimes with guys. They're like, oh, this guy's getting um, too far up. Let me sink in. I'll put my arm around this leg, and I'll use that to come out and around. And bad things happen to you. If you wanted to hold on to that to then come to your base to then go to a single, that's a way you could do it, but just sneaking out the back. And again, I'm not saying Mike Perry was doing that. I'm just sort of making a point here. I see this kind of thing uh, a lot. Anyway, he uh, shakes off Donald Cerrone, and now we go to guard, right? So here's guard. Okay, real quickly, who had the blue gloves? Mike Perry. Who had the red gloves? Cowboy Cerrone. So look at this. You've got a glove of Mike Perry extended all the way down by the head. Ooh, that's a no-no because... You've got a guy like Don Cerrone who's got real act. I mean, look at that arm. Look at this arm from Mike Perry. Let me just uh, look at this. Look at that. <laughs> arm bar. Arm bar city all the time. It's just all the way. He's bent over, arm extended. Um, I'm not saying that you can't bend over and then punch. Of course, Mike Perry knows that a lot better than I do. I'm just saying with a guy who's got real dynamic hips like Don Cerrone, it's just a risk you're running, you know what I mean? So he runs the risk, and look at Cerrone. Cerrone, watch his right hand. He's got it kind of trapped like this. He's going to whip his hip. So what happens is he actually drops this leg and then whips it around as he pushes the head away because you're creating a lane for the leg to come around like that. See that? You just whip it around, and look at his hips in the air, yeah? Dal Cerrone has always had a really good guard, and the reason why is, yes, he's long and lanky, but it's more than that. He's got dynamic hips. He moves them quickly. He identifies attacks very, very easily and just makes it work and rolls from there. Anyway, so here's the issue. I think It looks to me like right there he's grabbing behind the leg so he doesn't get slammed, but I think he felt like if I do that, I'm going to lose this arm. So it looks to me like he kind of lets go of it and then gets dumped on his head and then holds on to it like this, and then Mike Perry tries to helicopter around and kind of stops there. So I've talked about this before. If you wanted to really do this, quote-unquote, the right way, which, by the way, is not necessarily always right. Uh, I'm, again, I'm not in any way critiquing. You would put the shin behind the head so that, that you can flip them. I've talked about this a number of times. But, man, if you know you've gotten it, you're taking a risk by just going belly down like that. On the other hand, if you know you've gotten it, and he said he could feel it snap before he even went belly down, if you go belly down, you can get tremendous torque. So it's all about weighing the risk and the reward. Getting the tap and getting the arm broken means that he did it the right way. So, of course, he just watched this from Cerrone. Just, arr, look at that. Oh, God damn it. That's me when I see the alarm in the morning. I have to come six states away to come up here. All right, so that's the arm bar. I could go in more detail, but you get the idea from there. That's basically how we set it up. It was just, I, he was just a much better grappler. It's kind of simple as that. All right, so let's get into this Yair Rodriguez stuff. Now, here's the deal with this. People ask me, was that elbow legit, throwing it behind himself like that? The answer is 100%. 100% legit, 100% technique. I can go through all five rounds, and in all five rounds, I can find all of the ingredients that led up to that moment. Basically, here's what was happening. Chan Sung Jung was noticing from his orthodox position, you did see some stance switching from Yair. He was noticing that Yair would just kind of pose off with him. With his hands low, he could either fire the right, the, excuse me, the left straight, uh, excuse me, the right straight. He could fire the right straight and it would land, 
Or what he would do is he would get um, Yair to commit, and then through the countering, he'd blitz or jam him, kind of running him back. What would happen was he could get A on the inside of the reach of Yair, number one. And number two, Yair often, though not always, goes straight back. Now, there are times where he circles out. There are times where he goes straight back and then circles. I don't want to tell you that he, oh, he's always walking back straight. That's not true. It's true enough that you could see that pattern develop, but it wasn't like completely true, true. So with that in mind, I don't have time to go through this entire five-round fight. I just picked three excerpts from the second round. From the second round, here's what's happening. As I mentioned, you're going to get a guy who's going to either jab his way in, jab, get a reaction, and then jam the space, or a feint, get a reaction, jam the space. And what would happen was he would get so far on top of Yair that Yair would just have no space left but to throw an elbow or to catch him. Oops. Hold on. Or to catch him with an elbow coming in. He would, he would lose the ability to be back at jab distance. You would see some of the push kicks were working for Yair when he would throw them, but he kind of got away from them. He had good leg kicks early. He had some push kicks, I think, through the first half of the bout. But really, in the end, that was what he was trying to do, was trying to keep that distance because uh, Korean Zombie was trying to close that gap quickly, push him back, make him make mistakes, and then beat him with his boxing combinations in the process. So here's the second round. God damn it. All right, here's the second round. Again, he's jamming him. Look at the space that... Yair is walking. They're at the center of the cage. He just goes straight back. Now, you'll notice the Korean zombie doesn't throw anything here. I'm using this as merely an illustrative example of what he was looking for. Through the jab, it got blocked, jams the space, faints with the right, noticing the reactions. But what happens now? He's behind the two black lines. If, you, if you've been watching this podcast since I did it before I was taking over this show, you know how important it is. All the offense, for the most part, happens here, folks. All of it happens behind these two black lines. That's the danger zone. That's the warning track. That's the first encounter, all right? And then he jabs his way back out. All right, here's another one. Watch this at about the 14-second mark. He tries a, uh, this would be a Harai Goshi. Can't get it, all right? He blocks himself. Now watch. They trade hands. Here we go. He's going to come in, and look at that. Anticipating it when he comes in. And pay special attention to something. Watch the eyes of Yair. Kind of never takes them off. He misses here a little bit because he misjudges it. This is my point. He's backing up straight. When the guy comes into him, he's waiting for all different kinds of elbow combinations. Here's another one he throws a little bit later. By the way, just getting on the two black lines. Jabs, right, pushes him away. Lunges with that straight right I was talking about before because his hands are kind of down. He's not expecting it. He gets him on the half beat. Now he's going to blitz, change his sides. Watch this, boop, and it lands flush. This is what I mean. He's already on top of you. Look at, for me, the eyeballs of Yair Rodriguez. He's looking even when he's doing this, when he's over here and looking. He's looking at all times, right? So, God damn it. So, God damn it. There. Hold on. Oh, here. So, he nails him here. See that? Boom catches him and look at the look at the eyeballs he sees it he looks before he lands at all times so you're gonna say look what does i got to do with the finish i'll wrap up here and then he grabs him on and underhooks and blah 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 here's the finish what did we talk about before he's gonna lead with the jab off of some kind of offense or he's gonna lunge right in he's gonna push yair back in a straight line which is what you see here look at him by the way changing stances almost look at that change his stances fires the punch, and then eats the elbow, right? He's changing stances through, God damn it, combination, yeah? But did you notice the path? Look at how linear this path is. Look at that, super linear, right? He was waiting for it, and then he just jams you on top of you to the point where you've got nowhere left to go. So that's where these elbow attacks come in at the last minute, and then he cracks him with that one. Let's take another look at it from a different angle. Yeah? And he backs away. What a ridiculous win that is, huh? Amazing. Look at him here. Changing stances. He ducks. This is what I was telling you before. Whenever he throws an elbow, he's not closing his eyes and then throwing. He's looking the whole time. Look at this little nugget of a detail. Can't quite see it here. It looks to me like when he throws this elbow, he actually looks up 
behind himself and lands it here. So he's got Korean Zombie coming over the top of him like this, and he looks and lands just like that. Let's look at one more angle, if we can. All right, and then he collapses. Ridiculous. Look at this. Watch the eyes of Yair. Very little there. It looks like he's looking straight down, but if you look really closely here, it looks to me like he's recoiling back so he can get just a peek out of the corner of his eye right there to land. So this is all about the forward pressure of Korean Zombie. And yes, maybe um, Yair could be better about, you know, working his jab and his footwork and circling out better. But he developed this system to deal with guys who put a lot of pressure on him, collapse the space. And when they get on top of him, he's got these last minute elbow attacks from funky angles timed very weirdly. And he's able to land them just like that. And I think he gets just a peek out of the corner of his eyes. I don't think he's looking straight down at the mat. Amazing, amazing win by Yair Rodriguez. Certainly one of the best knockouts I've ever seen. One of the best knockouts in UFC history. And another reason why MMA is basically impossible. That's the Monday Morning Analyst. All right, let's do this. Okay. We go now to the phones. Do we have our esteemed guest? Okay, is he on phone or is he on Skype? I don't even remember. All right. Let's go to him now. This guy's, uh, in my judgment, he is the best combat sports broadcaster in the world. I've been dying to get a hold of him when we have the new show, and we finally have a chance. Mauro Ronaldo joins the show. Hi, Mauro. How are you? Hey, Lou. Congratulations, and uh, glad to be uh, talking with you, my friend, and uh, glad that you are, are beginning to get more and more of the exposure that you deserve. I remember when uh, I was doing a podcast or these uh, combat sports radio shows before they became uh, – in vogue or to procure as it is nowadays. And uh, I was always, uh, first of all, impressed that not only your knowledge, but uh, the passion and the, the gravitas that you bring to MMA media. So I, I appreciate what you're doing, sir. And it's a pleasure to be joining you on the uh, MMA hour. Well, thank you for making time for us more. I really appreciate it. Hey, I want to tell you, I had seen the documentary, the bipolar rock and roller a little while ago. I took the time over the weekend to watch the interview you did with Tyson Fury. What a, uh, man, that was a, um, it's more than just heavy. It's important. It's different. Here's my question to you, Moro. You're open about these issues, and you've talked about them a lot. How did you get him? Like, was he willing before the cameras even rolled to just talk about all these things? Because he appeared to leave no stone unturned. Yeah, he is... Uh... Very committed. To, and and uh, thank you, by the way, for uh, mentioning the doc, because uh, as I begin to end my 40s and begin my uh, 50s uh, sooner than I would uh, like, I, I am becoming more and more of a uh, uh, mental health advocate. I've been to New York the last three weeks to uh, participate in panels and to be acknowledged for my mental health advocacy. But when it comes to uh, Tyson Fury, he not only, uh, you know, it was very open. He he wanted to do the interview, and it's something that I have christened the, the most important interview of my career because of the fact that with, since the release of the documentary on Showtime back in May, I have been overwhelmed, inundated. I know I'm known for my hyperbole when it comes to, to selling the combat sports product, but I, cannot, but I can't understate, uh, Luke, the feedback and the impact that this little documentary has made. And I've heard from so many people who I will not breach their trust. If they want to come forward, they will. But I'm talking titans in, in not only combat sports, but other sports in other industry, uh, the entertainment industry, the business industry. And so to have someone like Tyson Fury, who is the lineal heavyweight champion, a man who stands six foot nine and and doesn't, I guess, fit the, the stereotype of, you know, someone who has uh, mental health issues. Uh, it, it is just uh, illuminating to me that that more and more we are having a discussion that, that should have been taking place uh, long ago. The stigma surrounding mental health and the the, the, the countless numbers of people we are losing to suicide born out of that stigma is what propelled me to tell my story. And I, I'm very gracious that people like Tyson Fury uh, wanted to, to share their stories and, and so many others. Uh, Luke, you giving me this platform shows that you want to smash the stigma. Uh, the, the, the countless celebrities and uh, musicians and, and athletes who are now coming forward and talking about their own issues with mental health. And let's face it, combat sports 
We always talk about what's become a cliche, you know, 80 to 90 percent mental. Well, it is. And, and when it comes to that aspect, uh, we always celebrate the winners and we go on and immediately say, what's next? What about the losers? What's next for them? And how are they internalizing and dealing with these setbacks that can be uh, soul crushing? So I think mental health, you know, there is no help without mental health. And, and I'm just very grateful that Tyson Fury uh, came forward and so many others. Brian Dawkins at the NFL Hall of Fame uh, ceremony. I mean, you know, there's toxic masculinity in this world, Luke, and I'm not trying to quote unquote pussyfy our society. I'm just trying to let people know that we are all going through something. And the more we internalize it, the more that we do not deal with it by simply starting to talk about it, uh, the more losses we are going to incur. And the World Health Organization has deemed the mental health uh, crisis uh, the biggest humanitarian crisis of our time. So I'm glad we're finally starting to wake up, and I know I'm going to continue to bang my drum uh, until my final breath has been uh, released from my body. Well, Mara, I don't know if you know this. I, I don't have a problem talking about it. It's painful for me, but it's important that we not hide from these facts. I lost my mother tragically to suicide in 2003. So oh. you you raising these kinds of issues and then hearing Tyson Fury talk about himself being on the verge of death, um, both because of the panic attack he was in and mentally where he was, I think is incredibly important. So on that note, Mauro, the most interesting insight, the biggest, the, the, the tidbit that you walked away from that Tyson Fury interview, what stood out to you the most? From a great question. And simply, he actually taught me something that I, I had been juggling or, or fighting with for so long. For whatever reason, I, I suffer from imposter syndrome as well as being mixed states bipolar. And, and I know what I need to do to take care of myself. And there are days where I simply can't or days that I think I simply choose not to as an act of self-sabotage because I sometimes wonder how did I get to be so successful when so many other people I feel are more talented, I feel are, are better suited to perhaps be in the position that I'm in, find themselves, you know, scratching and clawing and just uh, finding it very difficult just to pay the bills. So in listening to the Tyson Fury interview, the one thing that struck me the most and something that has inspired me is simply setting goals, Luke. Small goals every day. When he told us he wanted to, to lose the, the nearly 150 pounds that he has, and by the way, before the bell even rings December 1st, I think Tyson Fury has already authored one of the most amazing comebacks, not just in combat sports, but in sports, period. And, and for me, the biggest takeaway was the fact he said he wanted to run one day when he was nearly 400 pounds, but he could only walk 200 feet before he was short of breath. And he said, you know what, I'm going to continue. Maybe I'll just do this much today and then this much tomorrow. And I've got to say that since that interview, I downloaded a Steps app, Luke. And every day, I am no, I don't care where I am. I don't care what I'm doing. I'm getting those 10,000 steps in. I have a target weight that I would like to reach. I have a, a certain goal when it comes to my own social interactions that must be met in order for me to continue staying above water because I don't want to turn this into a woes me or 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 uh, uh, an excuse of any kind. But uh, Luke, it's 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 I'm treading water on a daily basis, and I know how I come across doing my work and 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 how intense and how uh, exhilarating being on live television is, and especially at the at the level of when you're calling combat sports. But for me, my work is therapy. It's 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 in a way catharsis, but I always have to pay for it, and and I never used to give myself a safety net. So it's, it's really simply being told, make a goal every day and reach that goal as small or as big as it can be. And I, I got to say, the Tyson Fury interview, and especially that, uh, I think his maybe not saved my life, but extended it, Luke. So mm. uh, really impressed that it was something so simple. And yet for those of us suffering through whatever it is we deal with on a daily basis, it can seem insurmountable. You know, what's interesting is we had Kevin Love in the NBA come out and talk about some of the issues yeah. he was having. Not quite as severe as Tyson Fury's, but they don't necessarily have to be to still have a profound exactly. effect on your life. Uh, everyone goes through different struggles. Uh, but the thing that's interesting to me is, and I wonder how you feel about this, having a view of the combat sports space. 
Is it just something about Tyson Fury who's leading this charge in boxing, or is there something about MMA in the culture that prevents us from talking about this, yourself notwithstanding? I, I again, uh, Luca, uh, you know, one of the reason one work why you're one of the best, and I, I, I do choose to, to talk to people like you. I don't try to do as many interviews anymore only because I, I, I sometimes maybe think that, uh, you know, I don't want to continue to just talk about fights and, and, you know, the X's and O's and who had a bad day or a good day because so many people like yourself do that uh, very well. Uh, in terms of what we are experiencing, again, I wish I could tell you the names, and I'm talking from professional wrestling, which has the alpha male uh, syndrome, box, all the combat sports. We're talking about men and women who, who do something only a tiny percentage of the population can do, who, for the rest of us, you, you almost think, is there something wrong with them in order for them to step into a ring or a cage? I have heard from so many people in so many different departments, whether it's from coaching to actual fighters, about how the documentary impacted them but inspired them to talk more about what they are dealing with. So I think Tyson Fury may be the, the, the talisman, the, the, the totem right now, but, but I, this is only going to become a, a, a more of a thing in combat sports because I believe it can help the sports itself in terms of, of how we approach what we do and, and just treat ourselves because we know, and yes, MMA, you look at the rap sheet and, and it sometimes disappoints me and discourages me because I know in all walks of life, you're going to have bad eggs as it were, but there are so many times I hear uh, heartbreaking stories in MMA, which I know are a byproduct of someone's mental health. And I've dealt with them going back to my pride days, certain athletes that I was talking to, I go, Oh my goodness, this person, you know, really is in need of, of, of help, but no, we're told to suck it up or no, we're told to get back in there or no, you know, you're, you're, you're a fighter. You're, you're, a, you, you know, toxic masculinity as it were. And I think that is simply killing too many people. And so I'm, I'm going to consistently uh, talk about mental health because we are so far behind in terms of uh, resources and awareness. And this is not a, a competition by any means because I've lost, way too many people to cancer, and I've known people who have, who have perished because of HIV and AIDS. But you remember, Luke, where we were when those first came to prominence and how uncomfortable and, and how much stigma surrounded those subjects. And, and yet now we not only embrace and, and show empathy and compassion, but we're spending millions upon millions to find cures. We need the same thing for mental health disorders because it is it is crippling our population and it is... Um, robbing some of the most gifted human beings to ever walk the earth from really making their contribution to society. And that goes for, for these incredible athletes that we cover on a, a regular basis inside the ring and cage. One more question about this, and I want to transition to some other things while I still have the chance to uh, have you on the phone here. Um, talking through these things has, I think, been to for you professionally – uh, helpful and potentially even rewarding and certainly cathartic in some kind of existential sense. But does it actually help you with the underlying conditions that you've been grappling with low these many years? <clears throat> I, I, like everyone else, I wanted to believe that I wasn't alone because when I was first diagnosed at 19 and through the first many years, like I say, the lost decade of my 20s were somehow – I still managed to have a semblance of a career, but probably should have been maybe a lot further in, in terms of the, the work and the, 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 the level of expertise, I guess, I was showing at the time. I deal with my issues like everyone else deals with their issues on a daily basis. Unfortunately, mine, I, I'm still stunned, Luke, that I may have been able to accomplish what I have in coming off especially 2017, where, you know, not, and this is not to humble brag, or, but I'm, I'm trying to really starkly portray a picture of, of someone who is not supposed to exist, you know, from calling the WWE Match of the Year Royal Rumble with John Cena and AJ Styles to, to uh, Anthony Joshua, Vladimir Klitschko, 90,000 Wembley Stadium, Floyd Mayweather and, and Conor McGregor, the double knockdown and the knockout, Matt Mitchell, or Fedor and Million Ankle, these I, the days leading up, the day of, I'm a wreck, Luke Thomas. I am trying my best to try to put myself in a place where I'm not going to let my 
my my superiors down, the sport down, and the fans down. And I don't know how better else to explain it, except I don't think I'd be alive if I'm not allowed to do what I do for a living. And that's why it terrifies me uh, between shows after every show. Is this my last gig? Because someday someone's going to say, you know what? It may be too risky. He's too volatile. He's too vulnerable. And yet, after I do the show, all I hear is, oh, my goodness, man, how you hear the best. I, I have these young announcers inundating me with, like, you know, you're my inspiration. You're the, my motivation. And I, I want to help people. I want to inspire people. But I want to let people know that regardless of the, the documentary, and I wanted to make sure that the doc didn't end, you know, with a, with a firm conclusion because my battle goes on 24-7, and I need all the help I can get. And, and even doing this interview, Luke, I, I felt anxious and a little insecure because I, I, I don't even know sometimes where I fit anymore. You know, here I am at the top of my profession. I'm about to call Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilde on Showtime pay-per-view. I'm calling NXT TakeOver, another huge special this Saturday, going to Hawaii with Bellator. I should be on cloud nine. I should be at the top of the world celebrating my success and, and everything that I represent. And yet every single day, sir, I wake up in a panic attack wondering if this is the day I'm going to take my life. So it's, it's, it's a huge contradiction. And and I just I, I just hope people can regardless if you're a fan of my work or not I just hope you appreciate what it takes for me to do what I do on a daily basis because because it's all for the sport and the, and the fans because I'm I don't exist without my work I truly believe that. Well, Mario, you're much more than just your work. I hope you understand that. I appreciate your candor coming on here. I know how difficult it is. I've said this before, Mario, and I think you know this. I've said this, but just for people who may be new to this. I, I think you're the greatest combat sports announcer walking the planet. Uh, you know, I don't watch pro wrestling, but you're doing it at that, that at the highest level. You're doing MMA at the highest level. You called pride. You've done kickboxing at the highest level and now boxing at the highest level. Mauro, nobody can do what you do. Literally, nobody can do what you do. You are peerless in our time, and um, I hope you understand that. If not today, maybe someday in the future. I, I really appreciate that, Luke, but I, and, and, and I sincerely do. And, and I have so much respect for those that are doing it now and that, but I have to also say this, Luke, and I'm being very, see, this is why when I get on with people I, I feel comfortable with and trust and, and maybe this is why I don't do as many interviews anymore is because I am just as naked as can be in my thoughts. I, I watch every show or try to watch whatever I can more and more difficult with the amount of product. And yet I walk away going, my God, and I have respect for John Anik and, and Jim Lampley and all of the many people I've worked with. Every time I hear another announcer do my sport, I'm like, wow, that guy's way better than I am. And and I become insecure and I become where it ruins the rest of my day. So I, I sometimes wonder why you of all people think that about me because I'm I'm having big difficulty thinking that about myself, and it's it's something that you would think after 32 years and after everything that I've accomplished that I could at least sit back and say, you know what, Mauro, you've done good. Instead, it's like, oh my, is this the day? You know, ask Frank Shamrock, who's my manager and one of my best friends, and someone who has literally saved my life, and Boss Rune, and and so many others. I know I have an incredibly strong support network, but I I just hope that. I can continue to work at the highest level, can continue to tell stories, and then that people will allow me to continue to do something I, I feel I was born to do and something that I, I love doing. And I, I know this almost sounds like a, a, a plea of help or that I'm like in some unstable surroundings because my career has never been better. And yet I'm just trying to tell you with what I deal with on a daily basis. I could come up on the show and say, hey, everything's great. I'm, you know, wow, I'm living in Santa Monica. I'm making great money. Blah, 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 blah. It, it's, it's what it is, Luke. And I want to be honest with you, my man. Well, I appreciate your candor. It's always one foot in front of the other, right? That's the best we can do. Yeah. We're a bit short on time, Moro, so let me just end with this one. I saw a tweet that you put out saying, hey, combat sports promoters, I think it was MMA promoters, that you were looking yeah. to do more commentary. And I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a second. This guy is doing Wilder Fury. He's with Showtime. He's doing stuff with the WWE. You mentioned just now bellator i guess with the uh hawaii show we missed you for december the last 15 yeah yeah december 15th How, like a did you get a response from that and b are we are we going to see you somewhere else no well, okay great question and and again in 
tweeting at uh, certain times is not always uh, smart, as they say. And and I was frustrated that day by by a lot of things going on internally and then and, and and externally. Uh, yes, I will say that I will continue to do MMA, and I hope it will be with Bellator MMA. We're negotiating. I love what Scott Coker has done. He's always uh, been there for me. I you know I'll never forget, of course, some of the greatest memories of my career were with Strike Force, and and so. I, I hope it's with Bellator MMA. I get, like I say, I, I was in a uh, insecure feeling story for me uh, pattern. And with everything going on in the business, and we see it all around us, the proliferation and the growth with all the, the you know, the different uh, uh, channels now that, that have combat sports. I guess I just wanted to send it out there for my own sake to prove to me that, you know what, I still can do this at the highest level, and I want to do it on a more regular basis. I'm a workaholic. I have too much free time, and my free time leads me to, to self-sabotage. So I guess it was my way of just saying, you know, don't forget about me. I still can do this. Believe me. Well, Mauro, no one's forgotten about you, but we certainly understand what some of the struggles you go through. Can't wait for Wilder Fury. Uh, I, well, I'll tweet out from my account the uh, the interview you did with him, and I look forward to Bellator as well and everything else you're up to. One foot in front of the other, Mauro. Thank you. Hey, Luke, you're uh, you're the best, dude, and I'm really uh, happy for all your success. Thank you for your service, and, of course, uh, uh, you know that you'll always be in my thoughts uh, with what happened to your mom, and for you to survive and thrive, you're also an inspiration. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mara. We'll talk soon. All right. Thanks. There he goes. Really appreciate his time. All right, we go from one uh, esteemed guest to another. Not, not a moment to waste. I believe he is now on the hotline. This is the head of Golden Boy Promotions. A, a man who was a uh, uh, one of the best boxers of our generation uh, and now is promoting a, an MMA show coming up here with Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz. Oscar De La Hoya joins us on the hotline. Mr. De La Hoya, how hey, are you? Up, man? How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thank you for making time for us. We really appreciate it. Oscar, I got to get it. I got to ask you this off the break because it's the thing that's been on my mind more so than the fight, at least for just today, is this back and forth feud you're having with Floyd on Instagram. Man, this has gone on for a while now, huh? Yeah, right. It has, but I mean, look, it, uh, it's 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 your typical Floyd when whenever he uh, he uh, misses the limelight or 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 he wants attention, he always obviously picks on somebody who who uh, who he can uh, you know uh, uh, so he can uh, get some PR. Um, that's that's typical Floyd for you. But look, if he wants to play like that, I can I can bring out some dirty laundry. Uh, let me ask you about this. Is he is he mad? And by the way, congratulations on the Canelo DAZN deal. It's uh, incredible. Is that is right. that what he's mad about? Well, no. I mean, what, what it is with Floyd, it's like he can't he cannot let anybody else have the limelight. Um, look, it's Canelo's moment. Um, I I I guaranteed him a contract of uh, of close to half a billion dollars um, um, in his next ten to eleven fights. And uh, with the zone, and uh, what does he do? He has he has to uh, he has to uh, wreck the party. I mean, that's your typical Floyd for you. It's like let let Canelo have his 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 uh, his, his you know his his time. Um, uh, your time has passed. Um, let everybody else, uh, every other young fighter, go out there and and you know and make history and uh, and and right off into the sunset. But you know your typical Floyd is is uh, is one who. Uh, who who needs that limelight on on him all the time? Um, by the way, what did you make of his very quickly his um, whatever the hell that was in Japan where he's fighting Tenshin Naskawa and then he's not and then he's tweeting pictures of MMA glove? Do you think like he's ever going to fight in anything like that ever? No, no, no. I I, I highly doubt it. I mean, but again, it's it's to just to get PR. Uh, that that's all it is. Um, I think. Uh, I think any any boxer uh, who even thinks about going into the octagon uh, uh, is, is crazy. I mean, uh, MMA fighters are are just on a whole on a whole different level inside the octagon because I mean it's it's just it's 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 two different sports. I mean, you know the, the strikes that you can use, the kicks. Um, I mean, my hats off to any MMA fighter who steps inside the octagon. It's, 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 I mean, I've been watching MMA now for like religiously for, for a while now. And it's crazy. It's, 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 
I mean, my respects. It's 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 amazing. It, it, the sport is just incredible, and uh, and 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 so any boxer who even tries to step inside the octagon is is uh, is delusional. So well, we'll get to your card here in just a second. Last question about Floyd. We're going to move on. I want to talk about your event coming up here, on November twenty fourth, at the Forum. So no truce between you and Floyd. Like this will just go on as long as it goes on. Yeah, no. I mean, in, in my side, I already stopped. That's it. I'm 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 over it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm on to what he's doing. But um, yeah, there's there will be no second fight uh, whatsoever. Um, I, I'm sure he's trying to lure me into a second fight because that's the that's the biggest fight he can make for his career to make a lot of money. Um, I mean, he had his chance when I fought him back in 2007, um, and and he uh, he took the decision in a very, very close fight, which could have gone either way, um, I actually had a rematch clause, okay? I actually had a rematch clause in the contract <laughs> for one whole year. So he had, he had to fight me within that year. And what did he do? Your typical Floyd. He retired for a year and one day and then came back and announced his, uh, his, his, uh, that he was coming back. Oh, wow. Yeah, that sounds about yeah, exactly. right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, so let's talk about this card here you have. It's going to be November 24th at the Forum in Inglewood. Chuck versus Tito 3. A few questions I want to unpack about this. How did you end okay. up at the Forum? Why there? Well, both guys are here from Southern California, um, from California. Um, you know, uh, uh, having Tito Ortiz be a, a staple of, 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 of California is uh, – was uh was uh was a no brainer um you know we're we're tickets are going extremely extremely well uh we're very satisfied with uh with the uh with the with the response of the fans and uh let me tell you one thing i mean i'm 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 actually super excited because every time every time uh we do some kind of p r or go on t v uh these guys, they can't, they, they, live, they literally can't stand each other. It's, it's incredible. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, they, these guys do not like each other. And, and obviously, you're going to see it uh, November 24th inside the Octagon. So Thanksgiving uh, Day weekend, because it's obviously not Thanksgiving Day. It's that Saturday. How would you end up on right. that weekend? Well, for, for, for boxing, I've been promoting boxing for a long time now. And, um uh, that that weekend, Thanksgiving weekend, has always been a great weekend. Uh, you know, people are home uh, with their families, and uh, you know, on a Saturday night, um, hey, you're sitting around. Uh, if you're not doing anything, tune in to uh, Chuck Liddell down Tito Ortiz. It's a it's a perfect day to uh, to celebrate uh, amongst family uh, during the holidays and uh, watch some great fights. All right, so let's talk about this card more generally, if we can. It's got uh, Chuck and Tito at the top. Now, there are some names on there that folks might recognize. Gleason Tebow's on it, Efrain Escudero's on it. But it's how, how did you build this card from your mind? It's it's not it's 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 built like an MMA card in the sense that you've got like what one, two, three, four, five, six fights on the main card. But I'll be honest, it feels a little bit more like a boxing card with a big main event and then not necessarily the same level through the ranks. Yeah, no. These these are these are. Look, I I'm obviously uh, just getting into the uh, into the uh, MMA. Uh, this is my very first MMA event. Actually, my second one. Uh, I I actually uh, promoted um, uh, uh, with Affliction and with Donald Trump. Uh, I promoted um, uh, Fedor uh, back in the day. Uh, uh, Fedor with um, uh, it was Fedor versus somebody but we promoted that event and it was a sellout it was a great event i had Orlovsky. a great time doing it but um or Ar Arlovsky, exactly Arlovsky, who was who was a boxer himself at one point uh as well uh trained by freddie roach but um um this card from top to bottom is going to be action-packed uh there's no doubt about it i mean every enemy card that i've ever seen is action-packed uh i mean these guys come to fight uh like like there's no tomorrow but uh Tito Ortiz's managers and 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 handlers, uh, 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 along along with Chuck Liddell's handlers, uh, uh, put this card together. Uh, along with my my uh, my matchmakers, they put this card together and they promised me, hey, this is this is going to be an action packed card, and uh, that you don't want to miss. Interestingly, so his the, the, their respective managers played something of a matchmaking role 
in what names got picked and then where they were put on the card. That's interesting. Exactly. It, exactly. It's very interesting. Um, okay. How has it been promoting MMA versus boxing? And here's what I mean. How are the audiences different from your promoter's perspective? I think I think it is. I think the audience is different, but um, but there's 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 so much there's so much opportunity and synergies. Uh, um, I mean, look, uh, it, it, it's no different promoting a boxing card. I mean, look, we do have more fights on on this card here. Uh, I believe there's 16 fights in boxing. We have we do a maximum of uh, maybe eight. Um, and uh, but 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 it's it's relatively the same. I, I I strongly feel that look, anything within the the, the combative world is, is 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 promoted the same. And, and um, you know I, I strongly feel that I mean MMA is only growing. Um, uh, the fighters are getting uh, 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 better and 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 they're they're faster. They're training smarter. Um, um, you know, and it's it really is. It really is. Uh, it really is a lot of fun promoting uh, promoting this card with 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 the likes of Tito and and Chuck because they know how to sell it. I mean, they know how to promote. They 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 genuinely uh, don't like each other, and uh, it, it's it's been relatively a, a smooth ride, a fun ride, and I can't wait for uh, the twenty fourth. By the way, real quickly, what was it like working with Donald Trump? I mean, whatever one's impressions of him today on that project, what was that like? No, it was actually fun working with him. I mean, he's a character. That's exactly what he is. He knows how to sell his name. And um, so I remember back, I think it was like maybe 10 years ago when we promoted this card uh, with uh, with uh, with Affliction. And uh, it was actually a lot of fun. Um, obviously, he knows what he's doing. He's uh, he's a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's brilliant, savvy. Um, um, he's a businessman. So he knows how to sell. And so it was. It was actually a, 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 you know, a pleasure to work with him. Interesting. Uh, okay, the price point forty nine ninety nine. How did you come to that one? Yeah, we we figured. Uh, look, we figured. I mean, whoever whoever. Uh, I mean, we've been we've been we've been we've been staging fights um, at a price point of around uh, lately uh, 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 at around uh, eighty dollars. Um, seventy-five, uh, sixty-nine, and we said, "Look, let's 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 give the fans a break here. Let's let's give the fans a break and not charge those crazy numbers." So, we we came up with the uh, with with that price point, which I think is perfect. Um, you're going to be able to watch uh, some some great great fights with the uh, with the headliner being a terrific trilogy, uh, um, which which I strongly feel that uh, I mean this this fight this fight can can obviously go either way. I mean. Pete Ortiz looks in phenomenal shape, and Chuck Liddell. I mean, he's like, I call him Chucky because he just keeps on coming, man. This guy, this guy is just an incredible, incredible shake. So I think that price point is perfect. I think uh, people people are responding very well. Um, uh, the the uh, the uh, indications are that um, it's going to do some great, great numbers. But most importantly, you know, the message I want to send here is that Chuck Liddell and Pete Ortiz. This trilogy with this fight taking place, they're going to make the most money they've ever made in their entire career. It, it's incredible. I'm, I'm actually mind-blown by that because I would have thought that Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell, with two names like that, um, um, they would have made a lot more money in their careers. But this time around, look, I was a fighter myself. I'm a promoter now. I'm just trying to help out these fighters. So let's talk about that real quickly. Tito... Uh, and I don't know if this was just fight promotion, but he told some media outlet, it might have been MMA Junkie, that the overwhelming, if not exclusive amount of his purse is going to be from pay-per-view sales. Is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, I, I'm i I'm a promoter that, that loves to share all revenues, and whatever revenue is coming in, we're going to share it. It's not. It's not about the promoter. It's it's about the fighters, and, and that's exactly why... For instance, you know, Golden Boy Promotions um, has been very successful is because we treat our fighters the way they should be treated. I mean, the fighters are the ones who make th these events happen. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, this, is, this is a great indication that, uh, look, I mean, the fact that we're, we're letting Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell participate in the pay-per-view revenues uh, from top to bottom 
Um, I mean, they're gonna be able, they're gonna be able to make a tons tons of money. Um, uh, the, the best purse they've ever made in their careers. Um, Chuck Liddell, interestingly, as a bit of a note here, Oscar, and I think you already know this. He's older than you. Now, this fight is interesting yes. because it's taking place in California, which, uh, in terms of athletic commissions, has the most rigorous standards. So, in that sense, you know, you're not commission shopping. You're not going to Texas or something like that. But let me just ask, man, is there? Is there you're 47. You, I, I believe you're 47. Um, you know, 45. we're at 45, even, even more so, uh, but still pretty young for a guy. And, and, uh, you were a you know high, high level athlete. There's no small part of you that wonders if like, this is a good idea for Chuck. Uh, no, it actually doesn't. I look, I, 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 I strongly feel like, for instance, with me, I mean, right now, I, I, if I, if I train a couple months, three months, I can go 10 rounds. I can, I can go in there with the best. That's, that would be no problem, but I would have to be disciplined and dedicated and just focus on, you know, a, a thousand percent and it would be no problem. I think, I think, look, why, why limit yourself, you know, to age? I think that if, if, if an athlete takes care of himself, if an athlete is disciplined, okay, enough to where he's going to take care of himself 24-7, uh, just like Bernard Hopkins, okay, uh, I believe is the oldest, uh, champion in, in, in the history of the sport at 51 years old, yeah. uh, just like George Foreman. Look at Floyd Mayweather himself. Doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, to, uh, is always training. If, if you do the right things in this sport, I think you can last till you're 50 if you want. Uh, it's, just, it's just a matter of taking care of your body and your mind. Uh, let me ask you about this Canelo and DAZN deal because it's incredibly interesting. You know what's amazing, Oscar, is when I first started covering MMA, well over a decade ago, MMA and boxing were very separate, and now their fates are much more intertwined. Yeah. Now, Canelo's deal is very different than uh, what's happening for a lot of other people. He's got a really a nice thing right. going. Are you um, not so much about Canelo? Are you at all worried about the way in which combat sports is moving to streaming? And here's the way I'm framing the question. As a consumer of it, both boxing and MMA, I love it. ESPN+. Plus. The zone, yeah. whatever it may be. At the same time, though, I just wonder: is a lot of this content, Canelo notwithstanding, just going to get buried under everything else? What are you? What is your feeling about combat sports as it moves into the age of streaming? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, as it moves into the age of streaming, uh, it's, it, it can be very dangerous for, for a fighter who's not uh, who's not known uh, for for the fighter who the fan doesn't doesn't recognize. Uh, yeah, you you can get buried uh, amongst all these uh, uh, different platforms, and and uh, you know I I strongly feel that uh, we still need linear TV uh, to uh, in order to identify uh, uh, these young fighters, in order to 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 build these young fighters and and build them into household names. You still need that linear TV, but um, but these these deals are incredible. What what's taking place uh, with ESPN Plus with the Zone? Um, um, I mean, somebody like Canelo, uh, who is, uh, who is the biggest, uh, who is probably the biggest star globally in boxing, uh, um, is, is, uh, is going to be, is going to be okay, uh, on the zone's, uh, platform, uh, uh, you know, because Canelo moves the needle. Um, you know, the zone, the, the zone forked over, uh, tons of money because they know that Canelo can bring in, uh, thousands and, and, and hundreds of thousands of subscribers for them, which means, uh, which means big business for the zone. So, uh, uh, but, but I, 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 uh, I agree with you. I think, I think we still need linear TV, but, uh, but, uh, we are moving towards, uh, towards the digital platform. And I think that's where it's heading. And, and I think, uh, Especially with the younger generation, uh, uh, not wanting to be told what to watch, where to watch, when to watch it. Um, you know, they want to watch it on their, on their, uh, cell phones. They want to watch it on their tablets. Um, but I, I think that, that Canelo Alvarez, uh, is, is a, is a guy who can fight anywhere, anywhere he wants to and people will watch. I mean, just, I'm an MMA fan, but I'm a boxing fan too. Just having Canelo, Anthony Joshua, uh, together on DAZN pays for it right. as far as I'm concerned. The fact you get everything else is amazing. Last question for you, Oscar, and I really appreciate your time. Do you think an MMA fighter will ever go independent and get some kind of deal on DAZN? I'm not saying at the level that Canelo did, but maybe something like that. Well, you never know. You never know. I mean, that's that's the beauty of being free agents. 
You know, I mean, when you have, if, if you have somebody behind you who is looking out for your for your best interest individually, um, absolutely, why not? I mean, look, there's there's guys out there who uh, are phenomenal, phenomenal fighters um, 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 that that can have those types of deals. Um, um, you know, I mean, look, you, you take a look at a, you take a look at a, um, you take a look at a, a, a Conor McGregor, or you, you know, you take a look at. A, uh, these fighters who uh, who are who are big household names. I mean, imagine if Conor McGregor was a was was a independent contractor, he can easily get a deal like that on the DAZN or an ESPN Plus. Um, but obviously, look, they're 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 with either with UFC and and UFC just works works differently. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing it November twenty fourth at the Forum in Inglewood, California. It's going to be Chuck Liddell versus Tito Ortiz three, and it's going to be a Golden Boy uh, promotion. Oscar, thank you so much for your time. Looking forward to the twenty fourth. You got it. Thanks, buddy, and happy Memorial Day, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Veterans Day, not quite Memorial Day, but uh, Veterans Day. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, uh, but pre- pre- no, that's okay. The uh, sentiment is appreciated just the same. Um, all, all right. right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. There he goes. Um, big thanks to Oscar Little Hoyer for stopping by. I have an allergy attack on the air if you can't hear it. I am ST Ruggling up in here. Um, I believe we're waiting on Chaz Skelly, if that is correct in my math. He's on Skype. Can I ask a favor in the back? When we go to Skype with him, can someone bring me a tissue? Because I'm suffocating on the air. That'd be nice. All right. Let's go to him right now. I made my point at the top of the show. I felt he got robbed. I'm not going to mince words about it, but he had he had a very good attitude about it. Let's go to Chaz Skelly now on Skype. There he is. Hey, Chaz, how are you, buddy? Oh, not too good. Not doing too bad. How are you doing? Good. Uh, have you? Um, how are you feeling? Forty eight hours after that terrible, terrible referee intervention. I feel good, man. I mean, it is what it is. Everybody's human. You know, God made a mistake. He had an opportunity to fix his mistake, and he didn't go back and fix it, which is upsetting. But it is what it is. You know, I'm healthy, and uh, you know, I'm not hurt. Yeah, Bobby's not hurt. We both got through the fight healthy, and that's you know, what more can you ask for? So I got a bunch of questions about this. Number one, what did Bobby say to you when you guys were in the octagon together? Um, you know, I can't really remember. I, I think he just kind of said, you know, sorry you know, ended that way. I can't really remember exactly what he said. All right. Yeah. You were talking to his corner too. Were you trying to explain how you were feeling in that moment or something? Yeah. You know, I mean, I was just trying to, I I guess I was just trying to give an explanation to anybody who listened at that point, but yeah, you know, I was just letting him know that, you know, I wasn't out at all. And, uh, and I was, I felt like I was past the, the hardest part of the choke, you know, uh, I felt like I was relaxing. I was to the point where I could relax. And, and uh, it was just a matter of time before I was getting out of there. But uh, I think that, you know, when you're talking to somebody like Ben Henderson, you know that he's been in that a million times before. And he already knows, you know, I mean, he knows how to defend that choke. He knows what was going on. I, I've, I've literally watched him, you know, just wait out chokes before. I mean, that's kind of what he does. He's really hard to choke, too. So, um no, there was. I don't think there was too much explaining that I needed to do to them, but I think I just kind of, kind of, yeah, I was just giving them an explanation of what I was feeling. All right, let me go through this. Number one, I went back and I watched this tape about a gazillion times. Um, your arm was loose, but I don't think it was limp. So for me, the initial arm test, he he didn't get that right to begin with. Do you? I, it was relaxed, but your arm wasn't flopping side to side like a dead fish. There was still some life pumping through it. Do you agree or no? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, he didn't do a test at all. He, When he grabbed my arm, he came in to stop the fight. I mean, that he wasn't checking to see if I was conscious or unconscious. He was stopping the fight. I was relaxed there at that point. And uh, when you're watching it and you watch it, it's like super slow-mo. I mean, of course, I'm relaxed. My you know, I'm not tensed up, so he grabs my arm and he shakes it. My arm's going to shake. I mean, what, what do you want from me? I, I don't know. I just was relaxed. Okay. I went back and I watched as well. He said your eyes were fluttering. I don't know how that's possible because your eyes were kind of clenched shut. Not shut, but clenched shut. Like the musculature in your face was like grimacing. So how can your eyes be fluttering? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest. 
like I said, the guy's human and he made a mistake, but I think he was just kind of looking for any excuse to like, you know, like, oh God, I, I'm sorry. I thought you were out. I thought I saw your eyes fluttering and then go back and look at the thing and say, but look, I thought, I, you know, your arm looks like it's limp. Well, you didn't think, he didn't think that when it was live, he, he never said anything about my arm being limp or anything like that until he went back and watched the replay and super slow-mo when he didn't even do an arm check. He was just coming in to stop the fight. But, you know, whatever. I, I don't know. As far as the eyes are fluttering, I, I saw an angle where it looked like uh, you could see me blink. Uh, yes. So, I mean, I guess maybe that could be what he's talking about. Yeah, but blinking's not like the eyes rolling back in the head. I mean, yeah, you can tell yeah. the difference, you know. Now, be honest, that choke did look tight. How tight was it? Uh, when he first sat with it uh, and my arm was across my body, it was tight. Uh, once I rolled and I walked away from his feet, it, it got looser. When I when I extended my arm, it got loose enough to where I could breathe just fine. And, and I was relaxing, you know, at that point. The only way he would have been able to finish that choke at that point would have been to lace my leg, and, and uh, but I wasn't going to let that happen. I was going to keep walking away. I mean, that's a choke that I hit every single day. I mean, that's my favorite choke. The choke that he hit right there, that's my favorite choke. And uh, I've been there a million times. Uh, I've been on where he was at a million times. I've been where I was at a million times. And, uh, you know, you can finish that choke without getting the leg sometimes, but it wasn't going to happen there. I was already too far out. It was already, I had already got my arm back across my body, extended my arm, created space, and uh, he had already actually relaxed a little bit on the choke too. So, you know, it's interesting. I always tell people this. You just mentioned it. Like you can get the choke from the position that he had it. It is possible. But usually, when you see two fighters or two grapplers and they're doing the three stooges bit where one can't really catch the other, and they're kind of just rotating in a circle, that usually yeah. tells you that something is missing from the position in order to make it sealed shut. Yeah, you know, he wasn't even bridging his hips up to get to get that leverage right there. He was just squeezing with all arms. I think that's the most upset, upsetting part about it for me is because I feel like once – once he let go of that, I was going to be in a really good position with over two minutes left in the round to work, and he was going to have to gas that arms, you know. And and when I got top position in the first round, I, I stayed there on his back the entire time. So it would have been uh, – I think it was going to be a, another long round for him once I got out of that position, you know. Now, did UFC talk to you about what happened? Um, No, not really. I had a little text back and forth with, uh, with Dana and Sean and – uh, Dana White and Sean Shelby, and they, you know, they both, they're both on my side. You know, they say it was a bad call by the ref. So hopefully we'll get to run it back. I, I haven't asked them uh, anything about a rematch or anything like that. I figure, um, I, I really want to figure out, I did ask about the pay because I, I don't want to, I don't care to get it turned to a no contest if they're going to take his win bonus. I mean, that's, I'm not taking money out of anybody's pocket. But uh, just to change a W or an L on my record, I mean, that doesn't matter to me. But if uh, if they do let him keep his money and it gives me a better chance of getting a rematch, if the if the commission says that that it should be a no contest, then, then I would like to appeal that. Let me ask you a question. Appeal. Yeah, let me ask you a question. It's a bit of a side question. And I mean this sincerely. Mm -hmm. A lot of fighters I've talked to would be irate. And you certainly are bothered by what happened, but you seem quite calm and reasonable and, to be honest, friendly about Bobby Moffat and the money that is coming his way. How was how was that possible? It's not his fault. I mean, he just got out there doing his job. I was out there doing my job. Uh, there was one person in the cage who wasn't doing a good job at their job, and it ended up costing me, but that's not his fault, you know. I don't have anything to hold against him. This is just a job to me. I, I don't I don't dislike the guy. I actually think he's probably a really nice guy. I, I like his camp out there. Those Ben Henderson's always been a super nice guy to me. And uh yeah, I mean what, what am I I'm not gonna cry about it. You know, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna move forward. Uh, I mean I put in a lot of work. Uh this was an emotional fight for me, considering I had the injury, uh came back. It was a hard camp for me, very hard. Uh it was a it was a hard weight cut for me, and I'm actually just I'm happy to be healthy, 
and uh, and to be able to jump right back into the gym and, and stay in shape and build off of what I have right now, you know. What was so hard about the uh, camp and the weight cut? Was it that there was time off? Yeah, I, I just uh, – my, my body didn't respond well to the camp initially. I was having a hard time uh, staying in the gym. I got sick. Probably. I got a real bad – chest cold followed by a staph infection followed by a sinus infection and just like i felt like uh eight weeks of this camp I, I was just sick the entire time i just i mean i was still putting in work and i was still in the gym all the time and and working as hard as i possibly could but it just wasn't you know luckily my my coaches were really patient with me and and uh, my training partners were pushing me hard uh because because you know this one would, would have been a hard one to do on my own you know without without a bunch of great support so it sounds like what you're not going to do is appeal to the commission. I'm, I'm going to appeal to the commission as long as I know that he's not going to get his money taken away if it turns into a no contest. But if, if he gets to keep his win bonus and, and everything's good, all the money's in his account and it, it stays there, then yeah, I mean I'll appeal it. Uh, the red red chief. Yeah, yeah, I'll appeal because I, I want the rematch. You know, I want the no contest. I think I'd, I'd have a better chance of getting a rematch like that. What is the UFC but, telling? But if, about they, if that? they just tell me, if they just tell me they'll give me a, a rematch without the no contest, and I, I don't really even care. Like to be honest, what's the what's it what's it mean to me? It's a W or an L on a on a piece of paper. I mean, I don't give a shit about that. Right. Uh, the the did... damage has already been done. What I care about is getting paid. Fair enough. Now I'm not uh, getting paid. I'm not going to get paid, so it doesn't matter. Right. Well, your win bonus anyway. When do you think you're supposed to hear? Like, what's the next step here? Where are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm uh, I'm getting out of an Uber right now. I'm still in. Can you see me? Yeah, yeah, you're can good. You can see me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just got out of an Uber. I'm I'm in Denver. I'm picking up my rental car. Uh, we went out last night and had fun. So I'm picking up my rental car, and uh, we're gonna go get some food. Uh. Right so. <laughs> I, w I won't keep you too much longer. What did you do last night? That was so fun. You get hammered. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, we went to, I don't know. We went to a couple bars. We ended up going to a karaoke bar and singing our hearts out. You know, just gotta, just gotta leave it all out there. Uh, gotta grab the mic and leave it all out there. Sometimes, you know. What is the Chaz Skelly go to at the karaoke bar? Like, what's your song? Oh. Uh, Fucker gently by Tenacious D. <laughs> I rock, I rock the house every time. It gets the people going. You know what I mean? Oh, I can only imagine. And the drink of choice is what? What's a Chaz Skelly go to? Well, to be honest with you, I'm a, I'm a beer drinker. Okay. But if you're talking about just a, I, I like to try all different beers, and Denver's a great place for that. I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of microbreweries and stuff. But if you're talking about just a regular light beer, I drink Coors Light, but I happen to, I like all beers, though, to be honest. You know what? That's the right answer. I like all beers. Um, all right, man. Well, I'll, let you, <laughs> yeah. I'll, let you, I'll let you go here because I know you're busy with the fam. But um, okay. you're not bitter, it sounds like, but you no. are looking for a rematch. Uh, how soon could you get back in there? Let's say they could give you one without affecting his pay. I, I would... I would jump back in there in December or, you know, whenever they wanted. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm in shape. I'm, you know, I feel good. I, I had no injuries from the fight. I, I mean, I could literally go next weekend if they wanted me to. All right. All right, man. Well, look, we appreciate your time, Chaz. I'm sorry it went that way. I think you got wronged, but you got a great attitude and um, it sounds like some tenacious D helped heal the soul. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Chaz. Take care, buddy. There he goes. Right. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, man. I don't think I've heard that song in a while. Effort gently. What is your go to at the karaoke bar? I will tell you mine. Uh, I used to have these for time. I think I told this one story once on the MMA beat. We're waiting on uh, Izzy Martinez, by the way. I think I told the story once on the uh, MMA beat. I had these two fraternity brothers. Can you believe one of them, both of them ended up being attorneys? One of them at like a very prestigious law firm in DC. 
which I can't believe. He actually made partner. It's like, how is that possible? You're a loser and a goober. Him and this other dude, they used to go to this karaoke bar in the city of Adams Morgan, which is like this party area of the town. And they would play any song. Like, it didn't matter. Pick anyone. Like, I don't know, George Michael or whatever. Like, whatever you're going to play at a karaoke bar. And they would just sing the lyrics to We Built This City, except they wouldn't sing the lyrics to We Built This City. They would just sing We Built This City over and over and over again to the point where someone had to grab the mic and throw them out. They would they would purposely go to bars to get physically chucked out of them. Uh, and it worked. It worked. I witnessed one of these once. And they were like, dude, we're going to go. And I'm like, you should join us on stage. I'm like, no. No, I'm not going to do that. And I watched him do it. And sure enough, they got the old heave ho at the front door, man. Ridiculous. My go to, uh, believe it or not, is at a karaoke bar. I like to uh, shake things up a little bit. This is just me talking here personally. I don't know if it's my go to, but I had the greatest success at a karaoke bar with um, Never Scared by Bone Crusher. <laughs> Yes, I did. I had a lot of success with that one, including the, uh, well, two parts. Bone Crusher can't rap, but Killer Mike has a nice verse on there. I got a hot full fever. That part is good. And then the part where T.I. talks about the guy shivering and shaking on the pavement. Man, the people were on their feet. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, Luke, that's not possible. You're a lame and a loser. Those things might be true, but they are independently. All right. What am I doing? I'm just rambling here. Let's get to this gentleman now. I mean, you want to talk about hype. Wow. This dude was so excited. He pulled like a reverse Habib, but for celebratory reasons, because his guy pulled off truly one of the most spectacular knockouts in UFC history on Saturday. Yair Rodriguez beating the Korean zombie, and his coach of Yair joins us now. Israel Martinez. Israel, look at you, man. How are you? <laughs> wow, what an experience. You know, I have uh, I was fortunate enough to be in Holly Holmes' corner when she knocked out Ronda Rousey, and uh, that was something special. Uh, being in John's corner, winning fights, that was special. Pettis, you know, choking out. Uh, um, uh, uh, Oliveira was special, but wow, this one was, this one was awesome. I'm surprised you have your voice. You do a, you you were like screaming and fist pumping. Be honest, man. I don't. Th- I've seen you. I I remember when you celebrated for Holly. You were beyond excited. But I've never seen you jump over the cage like this. Something just overtook you, didn't it? You know, me and the year we've been through a lot. You know, I met him uh, about six years ago at Jackson Wink. You know, maybe five six years ago, um, down there training. Uh, we built a strong relationship. Uh, Yair Rodriguez ended up moving to Chicago. Um, he was actually living in my basement for over a year. Um, you know, things ended up, we ended up go, uh, splitting ways for a little bit, but um, we're back. And um, you know what? Yair's like a little brother of mine. And um, a lot of emotions, you know, watching him literally a couple weeks ago um, was concerned about even fighting and what he's going to do next. And before you know it, we're the main event and he does something special like that. It was it was unbelievable. It was truly special. Let's get a bit of an update. I saw all the pictures from him in the hospital gown and the gurney. How How is he doing physically today? I'm assuming a little bit better. You know what? I spoke to him last night before bed. I think he's doing great. You know, um, his mind is strong, you know, and his body's strong also. But, you know, when Yair feels good mentally, unbelievable things happen. His He thought he broke his foot, you know. So in the first round, he's tapping on his leg to me that, you know, maybe his foot's broke. We kind of pushed through it, and then his nose in the back. They said he had no, uh, you know, his nose was broke, and you know, his hand, and you know, he's got three swollen, three, four swollen parts of his body that are pretty swollen. But they said there's no broken bones, and he, he's ready. He's he's feeling awesome. You know, when you win a fight like that, um, you you tend to feel a little bit better than when you lose one. So let's talk about the good and the bad of that. First of all, where would you rank that on the good side in terms of knockouts in the UFC? Just in terms of strangeness, it's got to be at the top of the list. But in terms of greatness as well, man, someone asked me, is that a top five UFC knockout? It, it probably is. You know what? It's um, the, the UFC has been around for a long time now, 25 years. Um, you know, I haven't seen all the fights. I, I don't know if I've seen all the knockouts. And, you know, we have that short memory, that short window memory of, you know, the last couple of years. But 
you know, maybe 10 years. I don't know. You know, I, in my eyes, I've never seen a cooler knockout in my life. He's not even in a video game. I mean, it was just an awesome situation. Um, and, uh, you know, I've probably watched it a hundred times and uh, it, it was awesome. Now, he throws a lot of spinning elbows, especially when guys get inside of his jab range. He does that to counteract them. I don't I'm, I'm guessing he has done this before in training. But for the folks who say, oh, that elbow was totally accidental, you say what? Well, I say, you know what, that they, everybody has an opinion, but I, we all know Yair that's close to him. He does the craziest stuff. He's got elbows from his back. He's got elbows from the side. He's got elbows from the clinch. Um, this is another one of those unique ideas and flows that Yair's put together. We've seen him, uh, you know, I've seen him hold back elbows in the gym um, for years, you know, without clobbering guys. And, you know, we, we were anticipating, believe it or not, uh, that flying knee by uh, the Korean zombie. He throws that flying knee a lot and um i think you know when, when he for the first part of the fight when we were going down we were anticipating kind of taking him down from that flying knee and then um yeah year got creative and last second you know he he hit that elbow but yeah i mean that's yeah year if you know yeah year personally and you've seen him train that's who he is he can do a lot of things that not many people can yeah my sense is that it was improvisational but not accidental like he was just feeling and flowing and through it but he knew what he was doing when he threw it. Does that make sense? That makes 100% sense. You know, they actually said it better than I did. <laughs> you know, uh, he he didn't, you know, I don't think he really meant to do it, you know, throughout the fight and going into the fight. This is how I'm going to catch uh, the zombie. But, you know, it's a skill that he's had. And, you know, I think he, he threw it. Now, you and I spoke years ago about when John Jones, before he fought the OSP fight, um, and I, I'm thinking of him today because he said something after the Gustafson fight, which was, man, I needed a fight like that. I grew up in the octagon that night. Did Yair grow up in the octagon in Denver? I'll tell you what, he grew, his coaches grew, his fans grew, everything about Yair Rodriguez grew. Um, it was an unbelievable uh, night. He, We talked about it. We talked about it the, the yesterday. Uh, we talked about, you know, how deep he went mentally, and that's part of uh, our goal with Yair is never give up. Um, you know, never give up. Never feel that you're out of these game. Um, never feel like, you, you know, you want to quit, and when you do, you flip that mindset. And, and, and you know, there's always times in fights where oh, I don't care how tough you are, these fighters are thinking about, man, you know, I'm coming from behind. This fight's over. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. You know, and yeah, you got a chance to push through all of that. And, um, you know, I told him, I dug, you dug deep, yeah, year, and he told me, I don't know where I dug, but I'll tell you what, it hurt. And um, I feel a lot better now that it's over. So, you know, when guys say that and fighters say that, you know, they push that wall back three, four feet. And um, yeah, you're going to be able to go even harder next time. When you jumped over the fence and he was laying on the ground completely exhausted, what did you say to him? What did he say to you? Okay, so... Okay, so it was crazy. You know, we're going crazy. You know, I'm a very emotional guy. And the, the fighters that are so close to me know that. You know, my high school wrestlers know that. I love my athletes. And I love, you know, coaching them, watching them go through these trials and tribulations. Um, so, yeah, here comes running up. We're jumping. I'm jumping on the cage. Uh, Victor's jumping on the cage. Um, it was it was epic, you know. And, um, yeah, here's this. Coach, oh, you know, we did it. And he goes, I said, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, I'm going to pass out, you know? So he thought he was literally going to pass out. He was so tired. Um, so as he was falling back, I just kind of hung on to him. And then by the time I tried to get back, because you can hear the commission, get down, get down. You know, then you can hear the crowd. It's just for people that... It's hard to explain, but I kind of got pulled over the cage. Uh, when Yair was falling back, I got pulled over, and then Victor jumped on us. It was just a wild scenario. When I hit the floor, Yair went down. Commission came to kind of look at Yair. I picked Yair up. Oh, man, wild, you know. But, you know, when I was screaming and I was going nuts, um, it's hard to explain like I was saying earlier. When you're in that cage, and Bruce Buffer's two feet away from you. And he's saying, winner by knockout. Yeah, and he you can feel it in your blood. You can feel it. The crowd's going crazy. And um, you don't care how you look. You don't care what people think about you at that point. You're happy for your athlete. Um, you're happy for everything he's gone through. And it's, it was a very proud moment. What was the game plan? Let's Now that the fight's over, what were you guys <laughs> trying to do? 
You know what? We were trying to stay basic. You know, that was a whole thing we've been working on with Yair for years. He uh, Basics were the key. Stay fundamentally strong. Watch out for his uppercut. Be aware of his pressure. He had a great body lock. We know that he's had a great body lock. We know he's, you know, the key things that he's very good at, we had to make sure we were aware of it. We didn't want to get stuck on our back down there and waste a bunch of energy because of the altitude. That was one thing. We know Yair is very good on his back. But we, like I said, we just didn't want to waste a bunch of energy. And we wanted literally, you know, we have, we have the X factor. We're from we're from Albuquerque. We're, we trained in Albuquerque. Yeah, you grew up there, you know, in his fight career. Um, you know, Cowboy Cerrone's ranch is in altitude. So like I told you a year, anything can happen after the second round. I don't care how badass anybody is, that altitude. There's a reason there's no heavyweights on that card, because they can't <laughs> fight in altitude. And um, we knew that. And I, I told you a year, you got the heart of a champion and the mind of a champion. You know, let's just let's stay basic. Let's continue to do what you do and let it fly. Don't be scared. Um, don't be scared to get tired. But let's play smart because we, we felt that zombie was going to, you know, we, we felt that the altitude was going to affect him. Now, let's be honest about this, too, man. That five-round fight was brutal. And your guy came out on top by showing unbelievable skill and unbelievable heart. But, wow, man, I always watch that when two guys are in a hospital together and they're, and they're uh, you know, you, you feel great because it's like, wow, what, what warrior spirit. At the same time, you're like, man, you shouldn't be fighting too many of those. You ever I get concerned that that was just a lot of damage? You know what? It's, um, you know, we believe every fighter needs one of those. It's one of those things like, you know, you tell a young athlete, you tell a young fighter, even the older guys, you need to get your ass kicked to kind of be woken up a little bit. And you need to go through some dirty fights, some trenches, but you don't need to do that every day. You don't need to get punched in the head every day. And that's one of those fights that we're going to have in our bag. And we're always going to be able to, to, to pull out all the things we've learned from that. But there's no way we want that type of fight again. Those things are deadly. Yeah, you're beat up, and, um, you know, that that's going to be stuck in his head, good and bad, for the rest of his life. Um, so we want to make sure that we take the positive over the negative and, and move forward. But, yeah, definitely, Luke, you know that. You don't want to be getting hit in the head. You don't want to get beat up every day. And those long five-pound fights are good for the fans, but they're not good for us. You know, we want to um, we want to try to do that early. Now, how did you have it scored heading into the fifth? Two of the judges apparently had it 3-1. One of the judges had it 2-2. I think in real time in my brain anyway. I didn't really score it, score it, but just thinking. I was like, I feel like it's anybody's fight heading into the fifth. How did you feel? Well... Okay, so while we were in the fight, I thought it was, uh, you know, I thought that he was, you know, it was close. I thought maybe we were down one round. I thought that the, the third round or the fourth round, you know, I'm not sure how the fighters were judging it, but I knew this. And what I told you you're going into the fourth and fifth round is we got to finish this guy. Um, because that's what these fighters need to hear when the fight is that close. Um, you know, if they think they, they just need to win the round and then a lot of times they lose, you know, it's, it's because they, they didn't push hard enough. So to me, it didn't matter where we were. I knew that Yair, the message to Yair was we got to finish this guy and we got to find a way. Um, but now that I've watched the fight, I thought it was two to two going into the fifth round. And, um, you know, but the judges are the judges, and you know what? I respect them also, so I respect their, their opinion. Now, can we talk about Yair's life the last year? What an up and down, right? <laughs> so he gets cut from the UFC, wow. which was crazy. He comes back. I know he's floated around, but he found his way back to you again. From your vantage point, what kind of year has it been for him since, let's say, the Frankie Edgar loss, or year and a half, really? Okay, so so anybody that knows Jair knows that he, he's a different breed, you know. He's all about his family. He's all about feeling good. He's all about vibe. And, um, you know, when he when things weren't feeling good, he wanted to get a new look and a new vibe. And, you know, sure, it's disappointing. And, and um, you know what, but you love him and you stick by him and, and you never close the door on him. And, uh, you know, before Zabit, I was uh, – I'm trying to think where I was, but I got a text message from Yair, and he says, Coach, I want to come back. I want to get to work, and, you know, I want to get ready for Zabit. And I said, let's do it, you know. And, uh, you know, then the more and more you talk to him, he kind of tells you what happened in his life these last years. You know, not many people know his – you know, his, his first ever coach passed away. Um, his Taekwondo coach passed away. You know, he split with his ex-striking coach. You know, he left gym, bounced to Vegas. Vegas wasn't the right thing.
thing to do. You know, he didn't feel Vegas was there. You know, he was in uh, Mexico building some townhouses uh, for his family. You know, Yair is a very... Yeah, he is a very good person. And um, when things are getting a little crazy, he goes home and regroups and his family's very, very tight with him. So, you know, there's been a lot of ups and downs and not many, not many men can, you know, overcome what he did, especially not a 22, 23 year old boy, you know, or young man, let's say, um, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, hey, you got fired. We were joking after the fight. You went from fired to hired to now the baddest man at 145 pounds. <laughs> You know, and literally overnight. And that's, uh, it's the UFC, it's the fight game. So uh, I think Yair's embracing it all. When you guys got back together, was it like picking up where you left off or were there some ironing out that needed to happen? We had to have a couple serious talks, you know, <laughs> uh, just like anything else, you know. Um, I am a very, uh, I'm a very aggressive guy when it comes to the fighters and my expectations of what I want from fighters and how I how I expect them to be. Um, in Chicago, I have a wrestling school. And um, in my wrestling school, I have boys from the ages of 15 through 18. And um, what Yair does on and off the mat matters. And it matters to me and it matters to the future of our program, these young athletes. So, you know, sometimes these fighters are on their own time schedule. Sometimes these fighters do things that are that, that for a pro athlete, you know what? They're, they can do live their lives like that. But you know what? When when Yair um, came back, we we discussed those things. We discussed some things that he didn't like uh, on on my end, and uh, we make adjustments. And that's what good coaches do for fighters. Uh, you make adjustments. You sit down. You hash it out. You talk it out. You get it. You overcome whatever's in between us, and um, we move forward. And you know, I'm blessed. To, I'm blessed for to have a great relationship with Yair. Yeah, you guys seem to be clicking, uh, and certainly he's firing on all cylinders. So who's he training with now? I didn't get a chance to interview him for Denver. With you, obviously. I noticed that the gentleman who does the Spanish-language broadcasts is in his corner for the UFC, right? Yeah, so Victor, um, yeah, you're trust. You know, it's easier for you to trust uh, trust some of these Spanish speaking guys and these Mexican guys that that are validated throughout the Mexican MMA community. Um, so, you know, he uh, Victor reached out to him, or he reached out to Victor, um, Kevin Gastelum, and and he stayed with those guys at Kings MMA. So um, he was calling me, talking to me about all the guys he's working out with. You know, he's so pumped he's going to start going to Tenth Planet uh, with Eddie Bravo. Um, you know, he's got his manager Tiki. Um, so then he'll be going into Huntington Beach with Juan Art. Chaletta and a bunch of those guys. Um, Yair doesn't like the snow. He doesn't like the freezing weather. Um, so Yair's predominantly going to be out in California training at Kings MMA in Huntington Beach uh, with those guys and, um, you know, doing his mental training and his wrestling um, here in, in Chicago with us. You know, I, I believe that, you know, yes, great athletes can overcome bad circumstances to get great wins. But I also believe that when they're dialed in, they're at their best. And it just seemed to me, I don't know that, I, look, I'm not saying his life is perfect uh, or that there's nothing weighing on his shoulders. I guess what I am saying, though, is, is it does feel like whatever storm cloud was over his life, I don't think he turns in a performance against the Korean zombie unless much of that passes. Yeah, you know, you know, I think that, I mean, you you got a great sense of of exactly what happens with these fighters. Um, if they can overcome it and, and they can have the performance of their lifetime, that's when it gets mega. You know, a lot of these fighters they can overcome it and get to the fight and then not get the results they want. So you kind of still fighting through that, you know. Uh, but yeah, you felt great this camp. You know, there was no problems in his training camp. Um, you know, he had a great post post weigh in dinner. I mean, we had 35 people at Ophelia's in downtown. Denver on the stage um you know it was just an unbelievable experience and and you're right you know yeah years free he feels free he feels he doesn't owe anybody anything he feels he's in the right uh frame of mind but he also feels he's around the right people and that's huge now what's next do you think this is a beat fight is a do or die you saw <laughs> Zabit calling him out on Twitter selfishly I'd love to see it I just don't know what what is what, what are you thinking what do you think he's thinking you know what? I can tell you what, yeah, he's enjoying his family right now, and he doesn't give a <laughs> crap about Zabit. Um, you know, we got a lot of respect for those guys. Um, a lot of those Russian Dagestanian fighters were um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico for years. So as I was down there coaching with those guys, I became friends with a lot of those guys. And I know they have a lot of respect for Yair, and I know Yair has a lot of respect for him. It's part of the job. Call these guys out. They want fights. This is a big mega fight. I think Yair's ready for anybody at 
this point. Like you said earlier, he's feeling good. I mean, he's vibing. He's flowing. I'd like to see the Zabit fight. I'd like to see him run it back with Frankie Edgar. No disrespect to Frankie Edgar. Uh, but he's a different animal now. Um, you know, and I, 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 I really believe that. He's in a great frame of mind. But you know what? I'm, not, I'm also not about pushing these fighters to, to, to positions where, you know, they're, they're not ready. And I think that, you know, if you year can stay around somebody in the top 10, you know, late, high top 10s, um, you know, 10 to 15, uh, anybody will work. Um, but, you know, if it's up to you, he, he wants them all. Before I let you go, Coach, I really appreciate your time. You're still working with John Jones, right? Yes, sir. I head down to Albuquerque tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow uh, we get to work. I usually step in about six weeks uh, out, um, kind of get John ready to go. He t- he's been taking the last four weeks, getting his cardio right, um, you know, getting a bunch of things right with jiu-jitsu instructor, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Tusa, uh, yeah. Roberto Alencar. Um, six gun Gibson is down there. Um, so we got those two guys on him heavily. Um, two, three day of workouts. I talked to Brandon Gibson last night. He got a great workout in at 8 30 at night. Uh, John's ready to go. And, um, that's all I pretty much got to say about John. <laughs> you know, he's ready to go. It's going to be exciting. And, um, I'll get down there tomorrow. Then I'll ask you this and then we'll let you ride. What are you expecting from this next, uh, maybe I won't say the last chapter in the sense that it's coming to a close, but let's say the last big, competitive chapter of John's career. What are you expecting from here? What do you think is possible? Well, you know, it's like a year. Yeah, you're uh, overcome a lot, and um, he feels great. John's overcome a lot, and he feels great also. You get that vibe from him. You get those. You get that energy. He called me the other day as we're uh, talking to Yair before the fight, wishing Yair good luck, and I noticed his head was shaved. And when John Jones shaves his head, that means he's all business. Um, so it was good to see him with his head shaved. It was good to see him with high spirits, wishing Macy Barber, wishing Yair Rodriguez good luck as I cornered those guys. Um, so he's ready his spirits are high and and it's dangerous when these guys can overcome some stuff and, and move forward because uh john's gonna put on a show well i can't wait to see it uh mr martinez you are a credit to the sport you know what you know what your problem is izzy you, you just not enough caffeine that's your issue you need more <laughs> caffeine <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I, I love what I do, and um, I love all uh, the people around me. So um, I'll fight tooth and nail for every one of them. And um, if it happens to jump over the cage and fall, I'll do what I got to do. We look forward to seeing the next one of those. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate your time. Take care. There he is. Man, that guy. He remi- you know what he reminds me of? He reminds me of my drill instructors mm. at boot camp. They were just super hardcore moto-charged. At all times, man. And uh, it's, it's, I'm telling you, guys like that raise your performance. Uh, so I appreciate him making some time for us. All right, we don't have a moment to waste. It is time now for the sound off. All right, let's go to my main man with the plan. Uh, in the back there, there he is. Yo, what's good? All right, how we doing back there? Being good, man. That AZ energy is is, is rubbing. Bro, off, I, I know. Yeah. I need I need him to have an alarm for, for me, just screaming yeah. to me to get up in the morning because yeah. I can go conquer the world with that. Man, that that energy as a coach must be amazing to walk into a room <laughs> and just be like, "Yo, you're you're working out today. We're yeah. doing this. We're doing that." And that's the kind yeah. of guy who just doesn't. He, you know, you you hate him in the sense that uh, you if you ha- if you dare to have an excuse. They have zero bandwidth for it. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. zero. Which is ultimately what you want. It's what right? you want. Exactly. That's why you get yeah. mad at them. That's why I hated yeah, my yeah. drill instructors. And then I left and I was like, oh, wait, I actually did a lot of things under their tutelage. Yeah. Uh, all right. What do we got here, folks, for the calls today? All right. We got a bunch of calls. By the way, we still have another interview left. So, yes, we do. We, we should that, take, we'll join a little bit later. Yep. Um, so let's take, uh, you know, today's actually the UFC's uh, birthday, right? 25 yeah it is um so let's let's discuss the the event and and how they celebrated uh if they celebrated the right way uh on saturday all right hey guys this is josh from windsor ontario uh just a quick question about the 25th anniversary show there was a lot of criticism about bellator 200 taking place overseas and not in america do you feel like it was the wrong move to have the 25th anniversary show as a Fox event as opposed to a pay-per-view and not on the night of the actual 25th anniversary. And also didn't seem like Dana White was present either. Do you feel like any of this will, will come to light and that maybe it took away from the importance of the event? Thanks guys. Love the show. Love how you flipped it. You made it your own and it's awesome. Take care. Bye. By the way, in terms of making the show our own, we haven't even gotten 
close to doing that yet. Yeah, we've yeah, made yeah. some progress, but this is this is a beta. This, this is, a beta. is the this is wait till you see two or three point oh. Anyway, yeah. let me uh let me I don't know how you feel about this one. Let's let's go through it. Graphics package we loved. Yes. Sound Denver check. Denver check. The fact that you couldn't do it on the day itself to me is irrelevant. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't possibly you can't possibly compete with this show. So you know, it was a good idea that they had it. On I'm Saturday. pretty sure Dana White was there. I believe I saw he him was speak there. to yes. uh, Megan. Oh, no, sorry, Laura Senko. Mm-hmm. Well, I believe was there. Shout but he to- wasn't there in the sense of I don't think he he had a, like a no. He didn't promote press yeah. conference. Yeah, yeah. So in all those things, uh, I give them high marks. In terms of promoting it, they just didn't put in a lot of effort. Yeah. I don't really, I don't really know. I I, my, my buddy lives in Denver. He's a UFC fan. He didn't go because he's like he didn't even know until I told him, mm-hmm. uh, which tells me they didn't really dig too much into that Denver market nationally. They didn't promote it. So like it's like, what do you want me to say? They're at the end of this Fox deal. I think they're just kind of punting a little bit. I appreciated the effort that they put in. It would have been nice if it had been a little bit more, but it just wasn't. I don't know. Yeah. I I do think, and this caller brings up something interesting, it should have been a pay-per-view, right? I mean, yeah, uh, they should have, I don't know, maybe had the, the, the fight night before and then had UFC 230 be this weekend or something, um, this past weekend. It should have felt more important, right? 25 years, that's that's a nice, solid, uh, you know, number. Yeah, I, well, the thing is, are we going to do this every five years, though? It's like, oh, here's sure, our... why not? Are we... <laughs> Are we? 30? Come on, man. It feels like, you know, we, oh, here's the 20th celebration. Here's the 25th. Here's the 30th. It's like, are we going to have to hey, have. You only turn 25 once. I understand, but like, are we going to have these reflections about how far we've come from the SEG era every five years? Like, on some point, I kind of get that it's like, yeah, all right, it's cool. Yeah. You know? All right, I guess you're right. I, I look, I would have preferred a pay per view, but I don't think it's that big a deal. Yeah, it, it is not that big of a deal, but they did, they did so, sort of undersell it. I, I agree. Yeah. All right. Now we got a lady caller. Ooh. We haven't had a, a lady caller in a while. That's because ladies don't, don't watch the show. Hey, this is Alexandria Patton from Gainesville, Florida. Shout out Shady Swisher. So my question for you, Luke and Danny, is who do you think Cowboy's next opponent's going to be? I heard he's going down to 155, and they already have an opponent lined up. So who's it going to be? Thanks, guys. So I don't know who that. Who she shouted out yeah, there? I but, know. Was that some millennial lit AF thing that I don't understand? I don't know. The connection was 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 a little shady. Swisha. You know, I have no idea. Yeah. Hey, but shout out to, to Gaines uh, to Gainesville. I've been there before. I had a lot of friends that went to UF. It's a, it's a nice town. Gainesville. Yeah, Gainesville, Florida. I would Underrated. rather die than live in Gainesville. Underrated, Florida. man. You should take a trip. <laughs> I won't. Cheap drinks. You can get drinks for seventy five. I have cheap drinks in my living room. I don't need for seventy five do that. cents. Uh, well, I don't know about that, but how good uh, can they be for seventy five cents? Well. Not so great, but if you're a college student on a budget, man, that's that's <laughs> heaven. Yeah. Uh, all right, who's next for Cowboy? Well, we talked about Justin Gaethje. I mean, I don't know how you go any other place than Justin Gaethje, right? Like, I guess you could say maybe where, where is he ranked currently, uh, Cerrone at lightweight? Well, he's not ranked because oh, because he was at welterweight, he's considered a welterweight, and so there he's twelve. So if you go over to lightweight, here is uh, ten and below, Michael Chiesa. James Vick, Alexander Hernandez, Francisco Trinaldo, Dan Hooker, and Paul Felder. Boy, a Dan Hooker fight. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, but like... I'm oh, you're hating of... on the Dan Hooker thing? Look, 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 look. No, no, no. I think it's a fantastic fight. The, the, the wonderful thing about Cowboys is that you can literally pit him against anybody, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah. great fight. Sign well, me up. Hernandez is taking a but... fight on short notice. Felder and Vick are back together. There's Massa Renduba, but that doesn't do anything for me. Hooker I could go yeah. with. Uh, Diaz, obviously, but they already done that. Iaquinta is going to be facing Lee, Pettis, and then Gaethje. So Gaethje. So the thing with Hooker is that I'm kind of tired of seeing um, Cowboy just go up against these young. I mean, and I know he doesn't have an issue with it against these like young up and coming guys. Um, let's face him with someone in his era. I feel like there's still a lot of guys that are his age that are fantastic fights. Um, we almost saw uh, Jose Aldo versus Cowboy Cerrone at UFC Sao Paulo earlier this year. They almost booked that fight. Uh-huh. Why not? Jose Aldo's been talking about 155, you know, a good uh, WEC throwback. You can put that. You can put that in the main event of of, of an ESPN card. All right, it's pretty. Uh, I'd be okay with that. I'd be okay, but I, I keep yeah. go. I, I I get your point. It's like they keep feeding this guy to the wolves. Yeah, but that's sort of what he likes. And if that's what he likes, I could easily get on board with a Dan Hooker fight. But if they want to go higher, Justin Gaethje's fine too. Yeah, Justin Gaethje would be also a really fun fight. But there's not a lot of wrong answers. There's just guys exactly. who are booked. Uh, and Kiesa, by the way, has jumped over to welterweight, so he's not, he doesn't even count. Yeah, that's true. All right, next. All right, let's talk about the main event. This is Bobby from Providence, Rhode Island. Hey, guys. How's it going? Terrible. Oh, that's great. 
Hey, I was wondering, who do you think was winning that Korean zombie Yari fight? I've seen some reports Yari? online that were saying that they thought the Korean zombie was winning. Did they actually show the scorecards? And if not, who do you think was winning? Thank you. No, well, Have we know who was winning. Day. So what happens is... Happy All right, yeah, let's... You know the um, the uh, UFC will mail you, a email you rather, after yeah. every fight, they mail you quotes from the winner, sometimes quotes from the loser, and then they'll send you the official scorecards, even up to the point where how far they were. Now, if it was... Mm-hmm. If it gets finished inside of a round, then there's no scorecards. But if it goes at least one or more, then they send you all of that and send an email. So you'll get on a, on a fight night, you'll get like 12 emails from the UFC with all these, you know, however many fights there are. And then they put all that in there. So he was up, Screen Zombie was up on two and he was tied with another. When I watched it the first time, I thought um, maybe 2 2. I may, maybe le- le- uh, leaned Korean Zombie. Yeah. I watched it today. I didn't feel as strongly about it. I, I was kind of on the 2 2 mark. I could have seen three one for Korean Zombie. Wouldn't have had an issue with it, but I did not see it three one Yair. I would have definitely yeah. said best case scenario for Yair. It was two two, and I would have scored the third round. By the way, for Korean Zombie, he was on his way to losing in my judgment. Okay, yeah, I had uh, first round Korean Zombie, um, and and you know, keep in mind, I'm also working as I'm watching the fight, right. so you know, I'm tuning in and out. Right. So you know, keep that Which in is mind. A big deal, folks. Are really it is a huge deal. Yeah, you you solely want to be focused on 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 the fight, and that's it. Um, but anyway, so I had the first round to um, Korean Zombie, second and third to Yair, and fourth I had it to Korean Zombie. Okay. So I had it tied up. Okay, you did. Going into, yeah. yeah. I can't remember how round by round I scored it. I but it was a close fight, man. It was super close. It was close. It just felt like yeah. to me that as the time went on, the boxing, uh, the jab in particular of Korean Zombie began to take over. Yeah, for sure. Sorry that I'm having uh, an allergy attack. I can barely breathe. Hey, all good, man. You got you're repping there the the flu season starter starter pack. Jesus Christ, man! Yeah. I am getting torn up here. Sorry. Just need some Dayquil. Well, yeah. someone's gonna hear this on the audio podcast, and yeah. they're gonna get all bitter, and all the YouTube commenters are gonna tear me to pieces. But what can I do? I mean, I'm supposed to take an Allegro on the air. All right. Um. So let's discuss. Uh. You know, so a little, a few stats that got thrown out there uh, about the main event. Okay. Hey, what's going on, guys? This is John. I'm calling from Elizabeth, New Jersey. Now, look, bro, I don't want to sound crazy because I was saying it all night, but doesn't Korean Zombie and Yair Rodriguez, don't they look like they're the same height? Why is there such a big discrepancy on the stats, though? It says that Korean Zombie's 5'7 and Yair's 5'11. I'm watching these guys weigh in. I'm watching them face off. That can't be fact, man. Those guys look about the same height. Their level for a four-inch discrepancy is a is a four-inch discrepancy, ain't it? It's like John versus it's like John Jones versus DC. Like, it, 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 is is like height different? Like, do they the numbers are different in Korea or something? That dude's not five seven. You know what I mean? Either that or yeah, he's not five eleven, and I'm pretty sure he's five eleven. I don't know. Call me crazy, but they look the same height. Thanks, guys. I don't know. Can you look into that? All right, so fun little question here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so <laughs> actually on the UFC page, and if you look in Wikipedia, Chen Song Young, Korean Zombie, is 5'7". Yair Rodriguez, 5'11", but they're pretty much the same height. Yeah, the UFC I just often watches that, Yes, I, I once, when I was coming up and, and doing videos on my own, um, I did a breakdown with uh, Marcus Brimage, a uh, former UFC fighter, about John Jones versus Alexander Gustafson. And they had Alexander Gustafson's reach somewhere around, along the 70s. It was like 76 or 77. Yeah. So I just went <laughs> based off those stats. And John Jones was like 80-something. I'm like, yeah, and reach, you know, they might be the same height. But, you know, reach is completely different. Yeah, don't really trust those stats. Sometimes they get them wrong. Well, I certainly think that John Jones's reach is uh, beyond anybody else's. But the, yeah. the thing that folks have to realize is it's not merely your reach. It's how you use it. How good your timing is also affects how you maximize your reach. And I would say that Chan Sung uh, Jung, who is, according to my what I'm reading here, has a slightly greater reach than Yair. He used that slightly greater reach very, 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 very effectively. He he was first to the jab a lot. He was first with the crosses a lot. He was jamming into the space so that the fight was constantly taking place at his boxing range. So, um, by the way, Fightnomics has shown that there's not much of a correlation between um, – Height differential in terms of having the advantage there and mm-hmm. success, but of course there is with the reach. So yeah, for sure. take that for what it's worth. Cool. Um, let's move on now to uh, the heavyweight division, and someone's got a little bit of a, um, I guess, a, a proposition for you. Oh God. 
A million dollars to bang your hey guys, wife. This is Rob from <laughs> Toronto. It's not that. Uh, I was just wondering your thoughts. Uh, let's just say that DC does what he's supposed to do. March, he beats Brock. Um, are we just back to where we were with the heavyweight division? Is it just going to be Stipe on top, a bunch of older guys? You know, he's fighting them off. Uh, do you really buy into John Jones going up there eventually? Um, yeah, just let me know your thoughts. And also, if Brock beats DC, will you do a shot of yellow mustard on air? Thanks. Will you? Why would I do a shot of yellow mustard on air? I mean, what do you think uh, DC... It's like if think... Brock beats DC, you're going to go eat a pile of feces? Why would I do that? I'm not making a bet or something. Uh-huh. That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess the answer is no. I mean, how confident are you... That DC will will be Corman. If D- I mean, if, if, that DC will be Brock. If Brock beats DC, are you going to stick your genitalia in a bear trap? No. no why, why why would I do that? That makes no sense at all. No, uh, I'm not confident that uh, Brock is going to beat DC. I think DC is going to handle him, no yeah. problem. Um, and so, I asked the question goes, where are you? Like, where does that put you at such a position? There's a bit of a well, we're back when we started to a degree. But Stipe, folks forget, he's 35. I think he's going to be 36 here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. That's still not necessarily over the hill for a heavyweight. But it's not spring chicken territory either. Um, I do think that guys, heavyweights having this revolution where a lot of the guys are getting pushed out. Um, So who's going to be the guy to do all the major pushing? Is it Tui Vasa? I don't know. Is it Blades? I don't know. Can Nganu have a bit of a rebound? I do think he can. So it doesn't. It doesn't exactly put you where you were before, but it's not dramatically different. The only X factor for me is Kane Velasquez coming back. Even DC tweeting about it, saying the division's waiting oh, yeah. for you, belt's waiting for you. So that could be kind of interesting. But is it a massive, you know, does the division go right back to what it was? Not exactly. Is it a major alteration? It's not that either. So, Yeah, I agree. There's some young guys in there to cause enough interest, uh, as well as Kane Velasquez's return, that I've been dying to see, so. I don't think it'll go back to to exactly where. Hey, it Danny, works, but... if Brock wins, are we gonna? Are you gonna get a four hour prostate exam? Uh, no, I'm too young <laughs> for that shit. I'll pass. All right, uh, let's talk about DC now. All right. Hello, this is Ryan from Cincinnati, Ohio. My question is: With Daniel Cormier's retirement coming up, aren't you disappointed a little as a fan simply because he's just too good to retire right now? Thanks. Goodbye. No. You wouldn't be upset I know, at I know all? what not he said. No, bit. no. I do not derive pleasure in watching the winning beaten out of a champion. I don't. No, no I'm not talking about someone in a top of their form mm-hmm. losing to someone better. I am talking about someone this good. We're talking about whatever you want to rank him as an all-time great. Do I want to see him stick around? to the point where his, the thing that makes him special is beaten out of him, I absolutely do not. Leave something in the tank and walk away. So I, I agree with you on that part, but what part of me believes that DC still has a lot left in him in the tank. I mean, I feel like right now he's like peaking. I feel like he's at his best right now. Especially with his move up to heavyweight, which is a much healthier choice for him. You know, he just displayed amazing KO power against Stipe. Just completely manhandled Derek Lewis. I, I wouldn't. He's on fire. I wouldn't argue with you, but here's what I would say. I don't I think have, he's he's got way more than than just March. You might be right. I sort like I said. I'm not going to argue with you. The yeah. only thing I'm going to say here, Danny, is that I believe. Um, look, this was his second athletic career, and the guy fought till sure. 40. If you wanted to watch Daniel Cormier compete, you got a solid 20 years of it. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. He does have a, a pretty pretty solid career. All right, how how much time uh, do we have keep for? Going, keep going, I got some time. One or two more. Yeah, and I'm gonna have to run uptown like a freaking maniac. All right. All right, I'll let you pick: Askren, Ortega, or Habib. Ooh, let's do Habib. Okay. Hello, hello, MMA Hour and Luke Thomas. This is JD from the Almighty Ontario, Canada. Um, sorry, this is my like third call here, but once you start leaving questions, it just flows like. Just get to the question, JD. Um, I was thinking about this the other day. Am I crazy in thinking that Habib has yet to really meet a full out crazy level like wrestler? I was going through it in my head the other day. I know he's met a couple of jujitsu guys, but primarily striking people, if I'm not mistaken. Is it possible that maybe this? he's not too primed to fight? An insane level wrestler like a Kevin Lee, for example. Um, 
I don't know if I'm losing my mind on this. Probably am. But, yeah, that is all. Be well. All right, here's the question. Has he fought a wrestler the caliber of Kevin Lee? No. Kevin Lee might be the best lightweight in that division. And I'm not – let me understand. Be clear with what I'm saying here. Mm-hmm. I'm not declaring him to be. You said might. It might. In order for him to be that, he's got some winning to do. And the next step is Ally Quinta, and that's no easy task. Mm-hmm. And then beyond that, he would have some steps to go on to. So uh, has he fought a wrestler that good? No. However, has he fought good wrestlers or guys who have good wrestling ability? Yes, he has, and he's done quite well. The one exception, of course, being uh, the Gleason Tebow fight, but Tebow was, you know, the size of a goddamn Mack truck and yeah. certainly had his own USADA issues later on. Anyway, point being is, let me be clear about this. Habib's the best wrestler in that division and maybe the one up, right? That's what we're talking about here. So um, I understand. I want to see him against a Tony Ferguson, who I think has both porous but also very good takedown defense when he's deliberate about it. I want to see him against the Kevin Lee. I want to see all these fights, yeah. but I just want to be clear. We do this a lot with our champions, our good fighters, Danny. Well, what about this? And what about that? We nitpick it and we say, well, what has he really done? Yo, Habib has done the incredible. That's what he's yeah, done. Yeah. And I would also like to add, you don't need to go up against uh, high-level wrestlers to just see where your wrestling is at. Like, just by the simple techniques and the things that he's pulling off, you can already tell Habib is a very, very good wrestler. Like, you, you don't have to match him up against, you know, Ben Askren or, or Kevin Lee, although interesting matchups. Uh to tell that he's a really skilled wrestler and that he can, you know, take any just about anybody down. Yeah. All right, let's do one more, and then I have to go uh, running out of here like my heels are on fire, much like the rest of the SB Nation employees do on Friday <laughs> at 3 p.m. <laughs> All right, let's. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Yeah, can yeah, I yeah. tease? Can we tease can on this tease. show? Yeah, yeah, Everyone's sure. so uptight. All right, let's do uh, Ortega. All right. Hey, Luke, this is Graham from Rhode Island. As Max Holloway has pulled out of his last three fights. I don't. He didn't make 155. I don't think he can make 145. So my question is, who should Brian Ortega fight when Max Holloway pulls out? Woo. I'm going to remain positive and wow. I'm gonna say that he's going to make it, right? First of all, that is a lot Knock of hate. Yes, yeah, it is. Knock on wood, uh, Holloway makes it. Um, and I think he will. But let's say worst comes to worst, he does not. Who should fight for, for who should fight Ortega for the belt? Okay, let's couple, say yeah, and, and a couple clarifications. He could have kept cutting to 155, a fight he took exactly. on extremely yeah. short notice. It was a commission who stopped it. And he probably would have cut the weight for the other one, too. But he, my man was, you know, going through a rough time. Now, in the event that something terrible happens, who should he face? I don't know. Can they really do an Edgar fight again? No. Um, Jesus, who would even there be at featherweight? For I mean, out there loud? is. Uh, it depends if I think Aldo would stick around to forty five if he gets an immediate shot. So I think you could do Hanato make... Moicano with that. Yeah, because I, I was uh, that was two fourteen when Ortega fought Moicano. Yeah, and Moicano I mean, was winning that fight. Him up, yeah. Um, until the very last end, then Brian Ortega did Brian Ortega things. I suppose you could do that. Chad Mendez is kind of an interesting test. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the options aren't nearly as good. But I, I'm like with you. I think very highly of Max Holloway's ability. Yeah. I know he had a rough run, but okay. I think I'm hoping that he centered things out. And when I when he is centered, he's uh, he's a tough customer and he makes the weight. But yeah. um, but that was a lot of hate. That was a, that was. a very sour way to end the show here. Yeah, well, actually, yeah. we're not done. We're not done. Uh, we still have one more interview. But uh, that was a very sour way to end the sound off, Danny. Good job with that. Yeah, of course. You know me. <laughs> I got I to gotta make things horrible, right? All right, we got one more, right? Sure. All right, let's do it. Uh, I spoke earlier yesterday with one Misha Tate. She's now the vice president of One Championship. Why did she do it? What were the reasons behind it? Why, like, why now of all places? How long is she going to be overseas? And what does it all mean? Here's our conversation now. We are joined now by the new vice president of One Championship, all the way from Singapore. It's Misha Tate. Misha, how are you? I'm doing wonderful, enjoying the weather over here. It's uh, getting to be summertime, so it's hot and sticky. I think it's hot and sticky all year round here in uh, in Singapore, though, so quite the contrast to Las Vegas. Uh, first time there? No, actually, it's about, I think it's my third time here. Uh, what were the other two occasions that you visited? So I went the first time with the UFC to do some promotion. Um, as you know, the UFC is hope, it was hoping to expand in, into Asia, so I was here doing promotion. And then um, the second time that I came back was to do a seminar with Evolve. Hmm. And that's how I met uh, Chachri, um, you know, through those two instances. And you know, we developed a relationship, and I reached out and said, hey, what do you think about 
me coming over to join one and you know and possibly evolve and he was really you know, happy at the request and mind you this is before Eddie or uh, Demetrius Johnson were coming over to the UFC before any of the the UFC talent had begun to make the transition. It, well, let's let's unpack this whole deal if we can for a second. What was it about one that interested you? Uh, and I want to talk like initially, initially. I think I think honestly, it's the 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 conversations that I had had with Chachri and the fact that when I was in Singapore, I I even said way back then that I envisioned myself moving here for a certain amount of time so now it looks like I'll be taking up that expat role and moving here for a, a couple years um, but it, it's just um, I like what they stand for I like who Chatri is I like that he's a you know he's a purist in a sense and I feel like I am too when it comes to martial arts and the way that he represents his company with one is just you know it's exactly how I think I would do it if I were um, trying to, to promote a fight organization myself. What, like, what are a couple of your core values in terms of that? Like, when you look at one, what is it that they do that you sort of see your values in? I think that as as a fighter, as an athlete, as a role model, that we have not only a duty, but an opportunity to influence a younger generation and potentially change people's lives. And I think with that, that we should do good. I think that we should be um, is the best role models that we can be. And I think that we should teach humility. And I think that we should teach, um, you know, integrity. And that it, that's important to being a martial artist because it is a violent sport. But I think that people need to understand, you know, along with violence, is that we're training to be athletes, you know, to be weaponized athletes. And I think it's just important to have those core values. And, you know, Chaudhry is exactly on the same page. Um, and it's just how he promotes the organization. He promotes the fighters. You know, there, there's no um, – it's not really promoted to have trash talking or anything like that. It's really um, giving opportunity to change people's lives for the better. Now, I certainly don't want to put words in your mouth. but So if this is incorrect, by all means, um, please correct me. But are you – What's the word I'm looking for? Um, are you disillusioned with the state of MMA in the Western part of the world? Uh, I wouldn't. I mean, you know, it's different. I think the promotion has gone so far one way that I don't really identify with it anymore. You know, I I love martial arts and I always will, but I prefer it to be promoted in it a more true fashion you know that it's more about the fighting than it is about the trash talking that you do outside of the uh of you know the the cage the ring the octagon i really think it's important to hold those values and i feel like in the western uh you know promotion of it all it's become much more of a circus it's really uh be become watered down in a sense and I feel like the core fan base that used to be there, you know, more early on in my career or even midway through my career was more about the fights. And I feel like that has, that's gotten pushed away. You know, we've gotten to a fan base that's a lot more about what people can do and say outside of the octagon, you know, people flying outside of the cage and, you know, attacking people or the, the you know, the, the trash talking with Conor McGregor or, you know, even, even Ronda, you know, like I just feel like it's different than, than the way that I would choose to approach or you know be a part of the sport. So I hope I'm making sense with that. But sure. it's, it's definitely it's definitely changed. You know, it's it's a new genre, and I don't know if it's for the better or if it's even for consistency. To be honest, because I think that people are losing the value of the sport, so they don't care so much about fighting. They want to see the entertainment aspect, but for the for the worse you know and, and if it's not there then i feel like the sport itself is not drawing anymore you see these you know free fox cards that are incredible fights you know and and nobody's watching them the, the numbers are down because they want to see more than just fighting and i feel like the value has, is being lost now is there a way to get that back in the western side and do you think perhaps um if one is as successful as they aim to be perhaps that that all these things go in cycles, right? Is there a way to cycle back to what used to be there? And is Asian MMA at the forefront of that? Does that make sense? 
I do believe that there is a way because I think that um, a lot of the true, the, the more tried and true fans have actually been turned off by the way that MMA has been promoted because, you know, for lack of better terms, it's kind of a shit show and it's crazy. And it's like pe- people, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to be, um, you know, in the audience if, if, uh, you know, Khabib flew over. And, and, you know, I'm not trying to blame that. You know, I'm not trying to blame that on the UFC. I'm just saying that it's escalated to that point, you know, that that people are talking such trash that it's getting under people's skin. You know, it's getting under Khabib's skin to the point where he's not even really being, you know, himself, I feel like. So it's it's not – it's kind of scary. But I do think that there's a way to come back to it. I think if you, you start to have an organization that appeals to the fans that have been lost because of the way that – uh, MMA has begun to be promoted as a majority. I do think that there's um, a way to recall the fans that have been turned off by that Where, kind of other promotion. Fair enough. Now let's talk about one and what you expect out of it. This is, you know, look, you're changing parts of the world, uh, upending your uh, life in certain ways, obviously for the better, otherwise you wouldn't do it. But let's talk about one for a second. Where do you think they're headed in the next five years? In five years, what will we be saying about one? Well, I think globally they're going to have a huge impact, and I think you, we're going to be sitting back and looking at, um, yeah, just the impact that they've made. You know, I think one of my favorite things about one is that that you know Chatri Sitanyong has made it a mission to end global, extreme global poverty. Uh, excuse me, can't speak this morning. Mm. Uh, jet lag, extreme global po- poverty. Um, and with that being said, you know, he's, again, trying to, to do good. And I think it comes a lot from his background, you know. Jatri has a story. He was born a very poor boy in Thailand and grew up uh, 18 years in Thailand and, and happened to be one of those people that just wouldn't give up on his goals and dreams. And he, you know, he went ended up on Wall Street and was making, you know, tons and tons of money. You know, he, he graduated college over, um, over there and he, he became a huge success. And, you know, now today he's – you know, probably one of the wealthiest men in the world, but you wouldn't know it. You know, he's very humble. He's very down to earth. And he sees the opportunity that he's been blessed with to change um, lives that like his, you know, that like there's the poor children that can have idols to look up to, to be good people, you know? So I, I like what he's promoting over here. As an MMA organization, I'm sure they've discussed some of those aims. And I'm, I, I gather that some of that is not for public dissemination, but to the extent that there is some, like, what are they looking to do? Are they looking to compete with the UFC? Are they looking to just become a global brand in that part of the world? What What is their ultimate ambition? I think the ultimate ambition is to, is to, you know, again, like, I think it's to, to change people's lives for the better. I don't think it's just about fighting. It's about teaching fighters to be heroes for the young up-and-comers. I think that's their mission. And, you know, I don't, I don't think that they intend to, necessarily compete with the UFC but I I think that they ex, they plan to expand and you know do what's right for for one for one championship hmm. uh, all right so that when they announced the press release this part was a little bit confusing to me they said uh, that you were the VP which of course uh, is an interesting role but it didn't really say the VP of what so as I understand it you're gonna be doing are you doing all of the color commentary because they do a ton of shows what is gonna be your role there so not all of it. I'm going to do two shows a month. And I know that there are plans to really expand how many shows there are a month. And it's just not possible for, you know, uh, the same color commentary team to do all of them. So there's um, going to be a lot of expansion done. And I will be a part of that two times a month. I will be color commentating. Interesting. Okay. And the other part, as I understand it, was to be brand ambassador. Now, I think I know what that means. But what does that mean to you? Basically, it means to me that I I will promote the brand way and any opportunity that I have to do so, and that's you know that's what I'm doing. I I I, I want to show the world what true martial arts is about, and I'm very excited to be a part of this team. And uh, I think it'll expand beyond that as well. You know, we, I had uh, lunch the other day with Chachri, and you know, he said just 
when you get over here, take that couple months, get adjusted, and then we have so many projects going on. I'll send you an email list, and you tell me which ones you want to be a part of. And I think immediately I'm, I'm grabbing ta- gravitating towards um, the charity work. I think that would be really awesome for me to be able to be hands-on in that aspect, um, just having an opportunity to give back. So I think really the decision beyond the color commentating and beyond just being a brand ambassador and, and raising awareness whenever possible, um, that I'll be able to kind of choose which way that I want to be involved with one championship. Now, to what extent are, are you aware of or do you anticipate any way additional, let's say, uh, talent acquisition? Because it looks to me like it's happening on two sides here, right? You're getting the Nikki Holtzkins, the Eddie Alvarez's, the Demetrius Johnson's, but that's on the fighting side. On the other side, I know that they were at least courting some of the efforts of Robin Black. They signed you. Are, are, are we to expect more of these things coming down the pike? I'm, sh- I'm sure, yeah. I mean, that they're they're expanding very rapidly. Um, you know, we're talking about they just broke 25 million live viewers uh, per show. Um, I think it was like last month or a couple months ago. You know, they're, they're every show having 20 over 25 million live viewers, and it, it, they're anticipating to grow that largely. Um, globally, so I think it's going to, you know, just require more people, more more work, more more everything. So I don't see it slowing down. I think it'll continue the the pace that it's going and probably pick up in the near future. Now, what is the biggest challenge about relocating to Singapore? Like, do they have somebody helping you with all the official documents you have to put together? Like, I can imagine that moving to another country, uh, not the easiest process in the world. Definitely not, but you know, Chatri has a huge team and a great team behind him, and they're they're incredibly helpful um, in every single way. You know, we brought Amaya to the event, and they had a private room for us with a you know a babysitter and a crib and everything back there, so that we could go out, go to and from a baby monitor. I mean, just you just think of everything. They're just very good people here, and so they again they're making this transition very easy for us someone's taking care of all the paperwork that we just get the questions and answer those and and uh they're taking care of everything now uh i mean uh, this is the process for you is just getting started but i'm wondering like when you think about your life do you think about ultimately returning to the states at some point or is this one of those moves that could just end up being permanent well i do plan on coming back to the states um i think it's it's a loose two year plan is kind of what i'm looking at it like Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so it's a, a loose two-year plan is kind of what I'm looking at this as. Um, so I don't you know, don't know exactly, but that's what I have my sights set on for the moment. And, and uh, someone asked me this. I actually didn't know the answer, which is why this conversation is helpful. Are you going to be working at all? And like, to what extent did, did Matt Hume play any role in putting these relationships together? It sounded like it came more just from what you were doing, but did, did he play any role, and, and will you work alongside him in any capacity? Um, he didn't have anything to do with my role coming to one, um, but I'm sure he did with, as far as DJ goes, and I'm not sure about the other U- UFC talent, but mine was a decision that my uh, that you know that I made with my family. Uh, I talked with Johnny and said, "Hey, would you would you consider moving to Singapore?" And he was like, "Yeah, you know." And um, you know, Johnny's a great a great man and a great fighter himself and he's got a contract also with one so he'll be oh, fighting and okay. training as part of evolve so it's working out really well for all of us and um you know that was something that Chatri offered straight up himself you know we didn't we didn't ask for that but you know he's seen johnny fight he's familiar and said hey, we'd love we'd love to have both of you be a part of the team in in the ways that fit and then i guess before, as we wrap this conversation let me just sort of ask you this is like Look, you know how MMA goes. A lot of people make big promises, and one certainly did get an enormous round of funding recently. I believe it was $166 million, and they've raised more than that. But nevertheless, MMA is a hard business to make money in. It's a challenge for any promoter. Um, it sounds like you believe in their long-term stability and, and ability to generate revenue to be around for a while. Uh, I believe in their their sustainability more than I've ever believed in in any you know, MMA organization. I think the the difference over here when I when I come here and I visit culturally, I'm realized that you know the, the Asian culture is about longevity. You know, it's not about the here and the now. It's about the the long term future. And I think Chatri has 
a great vision for that. And I think it's also very sustainable because it's about the martial art, the martial artist and about the martial artist story and particularly about sharing the story about struggle that people can identify with. And I think over the long term, it will pay off dividends. Um, I, I think it'll definitely be a better long term approach for one. All right, well, Misha, uh, it's a hell of an achievement. You've been uh, kicking ass since you were well since you were in the UFC, and now even out of it, you're doing just the same. We appreciate your time and best of luck with everything involved with the move. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Luke. Big thanks to all the guests today for stopping by. Again, keep sending those tweets using the hashtag the MMA Hour. Always call that number eight four four eight six six two four six eight. We appreciate it. Until next time, stay frosty. <laughs>